welcome to all. Uh, the bios are in the book, you can read them. All I'd like to say is Professor Lynn Morris is our DVC researcher and Professor Glenda Gray uh, is president and CEO of the Medical Research Council and, they, and you probably know more about them than I do. So over to you. Great, thanks very much, um, Ames. And welcome everybody to this event and um, welcome to those online. I'm not sure how many there are, but um, certainly in this room, it looks like there's 30 or 40 people. So nice attendance. So thank you all very much for coming. So um, we actually did have a, a launch of this book, I guess, back in December or um, official launch, but it felt like we really needed to hear from the authors. And so that was really what the, the basis of you know, having this uh, event is about, is hearing much more from the people who contributed to this book. But it is also part of our uh, centenary campaign. As you know, WITS is turning 100 this year, and uh, we have a number of events, and this, is, uh, and this is one of them. But really, the, you know, the idea behind this occasion, and of course also the book, is really to showcase um, the contribution made by academics in a large proportion, I think 60% of the, um, the contributions are actually from WITS academics, really the incredible contribution that has been um, made uh, towards um, you know this this uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. So it's the book was really designed to document what happened with the intention of of how are we going to learn lessons from this and how are we going to deal deal with um, future pandemics um, in a better and more proactive way. Because I think we all know that uh, there will be future pandemics. Um, that's very clear, and uh, and we certainly need to be to be learning um, lessons from that. But I think it is also interesting to reflect on the role of universities in managing these kinds of what are what is essentially was a global crisis and obviously for us a national crisis is how universities can contribute to you know to to solving these problems because universities are unique environments they're obviously places where um, new knowledge is generated all the time and when you have a virus that nobody's ever seen before you know you have to do a lot of research investigation and apply your minds to how we're going to, you know, to, to deal with it. But I think also because universities are multidisciplinary institutions, and so you can draw on the wealth of experience and expertise from across the university and apply your mind to, to solving the problem. And that certainly happened, and it's really nicely showcased actually in this book um, that uh, different, you know, different aspects are, um, you know, are, are reflected. So, um, so yeah, so it's really a great pleasure that, um, that we're having this event. So thank you very much to Ames who pushed for us to, to take this to kind of the next level rather than just having the launch and, and to really flesh it out and to think about it. And in fact, we're probably going to be having a subsequent event to really start debating some of these issues and some of the, to take it you know, to, to the next level. I think you're all aware that there has been a call uh, to establish um, uh, you know, this pandemic institute, uh, and certainly that's put in an application, and I know other leading universities did as well. So certainly at national government level, they're certainly thinking about how we're going to be handling pandemics in a more sort of systematic way. But I also want to welcome people from, I guess, outside, and I see there's journalists and um, legal people and people from all different faculties, and um, so just to welcome all of you, and thank you all very much for coming. Um, to this event. And I'm going to hand over to Glenda, who's going to say a few words. Sabri, that's my book, hey? <laughs> exactly. You can look at, take a look at it. Just Katie's going to steal it from me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, Wits University is my university. I trained here and I, I trained here. I was an undergraduate, a postgrad, and I only left this university to go to the Medical Research Council. So it's always wonderful to return. Um, and I want to say that, that it was truly visionary uh, when. Ames decided to put this book together uh, a long time ago. Um, and a lot of the things that we were talking about in the book uh, um, kind of almost came true. So it's quite visionary. And I want to thank you and Martin and Dania for, to, for, for thinking about this and putting it together. Having lived through two epidemics, HIV and COVID, um, um, we can see um, you know, what is right and what is wrong about the way we react. And certainly what worked in COVID uh, was science. Science worked, science and research. Um, with, H with vaccines, we knew we know that HIV vaccines was the NASA 
for COVID vaccines, a lot of the work that we've been doing in HIV vaccines helped um, capitulate the COVID vaccine research agenda. So I hope it, it'll, it'll go full circle back to supporting HIV vaccines in the future. We also saw collaboration. Um, it was the first time Hi, guys. that uh, scientists and researchers collaborated with each other and, um, and, and Found. Yes, who, who worked in the in the hospitals and the scientists that um, evaluated interventions that let that can lead to the control of COVID. So that was what worked with science, and what didn't work um, was uh, the lack of um, of trust. There's a there's a huge lack of government trust, not only in South Africa but at a global level, and governments at a global level let us down. Uh, they weren't transparent, they were never ever nimble and able to adapt as things changed. And hopefully as we move forward, and um, we can address the issue of, 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 of trust, um, transparency and, and being nimble. And so I think a lot of the stuff that's gonna be said today will bring out those kind of themes about um, what does work and what doesn't work. And so I look very forward to being here and listening to the, the discussion. underestimate and these are data from the South African Medical Research Council that comes out on an annual on a weekly basis which basically documents what is COVID-19 equitable mortality, mortality using excess mortality estimates and basically what the data tells us is that firstly one of the arguments is well not all of this mortality can be attributed to COVID-19 but when you look at a synchrony of these waves in terms of recorded death and the excess mortality they almost completely synchronous, which basically tells us that the majority of these deaths, or at least 90 to 95% of this COVID, of this excess mortality, is in fact due to COVID-19. Now, how do we compare when it comes to, how does it compare when we come to actual mortality rate? So the first message is the reported number of deaths underestimates the actual number of deaths that has transpired by at least three folds. So excess mortality estimates is right now down in, in a region of about 300,000 deaths uh, in South Africa have been taken place uh, when it comes to the recorded number of deaths which is approaching the 100,000 mark. But more important is the mortality rate, right? When we look at mortality rate in South Africa, we're sitting at over 500 per 100,000. If the, the 100, if at 500 per 100,000, that puts us firmly amongst the top 10 countries globally with the highest COVID mortality rate, amongst the top 10 countries globally. If the Northern Cape was a country of its own, with an excess mortality code attributable death of 670 per 100,000, that would put the Northern Cape amongst the top three countries with the highest COVID-19 mortality rate globally. 
So we need to let, now we need to reflect. What did you set out to do? What did you achieve? You did not prevent infections from taking place. It's difficult to comprehend how more people could have died of COVID-19, despite all of the restrictions that were imposed on society in South Africa. And it's not because those restrictions wouldn't necessarily have worked within the correct context, but in the South African context, where 40% of the population are unemployed, to expect people to do social distancing in a shack is naive in the belief. It shows complete, it shows what seems to be complete, uh, being completely agnostic to the realities of the South African context. So what else happened with these restrictions? We failed to prevent infections. We largely failed to prevent death. At 500 per 100,000 people dying from COVID-19, we largely failed to prevent death. What did it do? Unfortunately, it destroyed the economy even further. We were sitting at the unemployment uh, rate of around about 35%, Alex, before uh, the start of the pandemic. That went up to 45%, the highest unemployment rate ever on record in South Africa, making South Africa, giving South Africa the dubious honor of being the most unequal society in the entire world. So it destroyed the economy. And who was affected most in terms of the destruction of the economy? It was the poorest of the poor. People that were unemployed, people in the lowest income were most likely to become unemployed. People that were Black African were more likely to become unemployed than other race groups. So the poorest of the poor were affected the most. The poorest of the poor were affected most when it came to uh, the economic consequences. What else? It's impacted on schooling. Again, children that came from the poorest households were most likely to be withheld from attending school. And the latest data indicates that close to 700,000 children dropped out of school in 2020 and 2021. 700,000 children. That's roughly about the equivalent of the number of children that actually enter into primary school each year, which is in the region of about a million. So impacted on the economy, impacted on livelihoods, impacted on future of children. Now, something which I can't avoid to speak about in this sort of meeting is COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and it was absolutely a farce what happened in South Africa, absolutely a farce. So amongst us is Glenn Gray, part of the eminent scientist group who drafted the paper to Daily Mail of COED basically asking where does South Africa stand when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines. This was done in January of 2021, 2nd of January of 2021. It was drafted on New Year's Day. And the reason for this is that these vaccines all of a sudden became available in high income countries demonstrate, demonstrating remarkable efficacy in messenger RNA vaccines of 90% protection, not against severe disease, but against infection. We saw a whole range of high income countries all of a sudden beginning to vaccinate the population at large. We saw some African countries starting to roll out vaccines. Yet vaccines were completely off the radar in South Africa. So they drafted this communication piece, also indicating that it was quite surprising that senior health officials at that stage were increasingly talking down the prospects for the availability and usefulness of COVID vaccines in South Africa. And that is exactly what was happening. So Piero basically summed up our status of COVID-19 vaccines, pretty much summed it up because this is where we stood. Response from the Ministerial Advisory Committee was, don't worry, we've got everything in hand. Don't worry. Uh, in fact, the reason why we're delaying the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines is we're actually wanting to see how these vaccines work in under, other settings before deciding which vaccine is best suited for South Africa. That is the reason we're holding back trying to make an informed decision. That's the reason why we're holding back on this vaccine. There's still a lot of questions to be answered about this vaccine. If it was anyone else, you might have been thinking it was anti-vaxxer that was speaking this narrative about we wanting to learn more about these vaccines. But this is a narrative that was a response to the article that came out in Daily Maverick by Glenda Gray and others. A response indicating that, no, you are incorrect in terms of your statements, that we don't have a plan, we do have a plan. So what type of a plan did we have in place? In fact, not much. And I'm convinced that the Department of Health is on Zapira's payroll because the amount of material they provide in is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. So what we find is a whole lot of promises being made. Overnight, the Department of Health came out to the document saying, this is our plan. 
We are going to vaccinate 40 million people by the end of 2021, not the end of 2022, 40 million people. They forgot to indicate where they're going to get those vaccines, what sort of community preparation has taken place to get people to accept vaccines, what sort of logistics has taken, what type of planning has taken place in terms of deployment of the vaccines, but they had a goal, an aspirational goal of 40 million people being vaccinated by the end of 2021 in the absence of having procured any vaccine in January of 2021. So, unfortunately, we did manage to get some vaccine, fortunately and unfortunately. I think the president probably, on his BRICS membership, spoke to the president of uh, Prime Minister of India, managed to get about one and a half million doses of vaccine into the country. That one and a half million doses arrived actually on the 1st of February. Very poor timing, unfortunately. And the reason for that poor timing is the night before, uh, we completed the analysis of the AstraZeneca vaccine trial. And disappointingly, with the evolution of the beta variant, and the study obviously wasn't designed to look at efficacy against another variant, disappointingly, but disappointingly what we reported was that AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a vaccine that was imported from the Syrian Institute of India, did not protect against mild to moderate COVID-19 due to the beta variant, for a point efficacy estimate of 10%, which basically means no protection. Uh, so this, uh, the, this was uh, announced the day after the vaccine arrived, and then was it a surprise? The answer it was not a surprise. It was even before we showed the efficacy results, uh, Penny Moore we had already been reporting that, listen here, there's antibody evasiveness here present, which means that these uh, vaccines are not going to work in the same manner as the messenger RNA vaccines, at least not when it comes to protecting against infection and mild COVID-19. So we knew that this was a relatively antibody evasive variant, and we could expect that vaccine effectiveness, especially for vaccines such as the AstraZeneca vaccine, which, which induces a lower magnitude of neutralizing antibody than the messenger RNA vaccines, were going to come short in protecting against infection and mild COVID. But we, want, we were wanting protection against infection and mild COVID, because that is what we saw for the initial messenger RNA vaccine. It protected well against a wild type virus, against infection and mild COVID. So we didn't show any protection against mild COVID, but at the same time, the same study showed that another arm of the immune system, which people were increasingly beginning to appreciate, was a main driver of protection against severe disease, and that's the T cell immunity, remained relatively preserved. The T cell immunity that was produced even by the AstraZeneca vaccine remained relatively preserved despite the mutations that had taken place of the spike protein. And based on this, together with animal model work that was done at the same time, where these mice were, challenged, were basically vaccinated for the AstraZeneca vaccine, then challenged for the alpha variant and the beta variant, what this animal model studies showed is that, again, these mice were not protected against infection, but when it came to what mattered most, and that is protection against severe disease, fatal COVID, these mice that were vaccinated, that were challenged for the beta variant, were com had complete survival, 100% survival, as opposed to the mice that were unvaccinated. So there was indirect evidence to indicate that the AstraZeneca vaccine would still protect against severe COVID, even due to the beta variant. Now, prior to this, the Department of Health was adamant that we take our direction from the World Health Organization. When we were calling for us to go to lower levels of, of lockdown in the initial phase of the pandemic, the Department of Health said, no, we don't want to do that because we take our cue from the WHO. The WHO came out with the recommendation on the AstraZeneca vaccine that even in those countries where the beta variant was circulating, there was strong indirect evidence that vaccines would still provide protection against severe disease. This is what the WHO said. All of a sudden, the uh, Department of Health seemed to have done a U-turn uh, and decided we're not interested in WHO recommendations anymore. Instead, we're going to do our own thing and that we're going to offload these vaccines to who? To other African countries. What variants were circulating in other African countries? The beta variant. So on the one hand, we don't want to use a vaccine in South Africa, but we want to send it, sell it off to the AU for them to deploy into other African countries where the beta variant was circulating. So what was the consequence of this? There were consequences. Subsequent to this, the study from Canada basically showed that the AstraZeneca vaccine they had 80% protection against severe COVID, hospitalized cases due to the beta variant. In addition to which, as it happened, they were also able to measure efficacy against the Delta variant which followed on to the beta variant in South Africa. Efficacy against the Delta variant was in the region of 85 to 90% for the AstraZeneca vaccine. So what is the not net consequence of this? So we had one and a half million doses of vaccine. We probably could have got more, which we decided not to use. There were no issues about the safety of the vaccine. 
high-risk individuals are completely unprotected. We decided not to use the vaccine, despite it only possibly offering hope for protection with very little chance of doing harm. That is the choice that we face. We did not, we, Department of Health decided to sell out this vaccine. We then experienced the Delta variant wave. So Delta variant pretty much displaced the Beta variant, and that wave was the most severe wave of COVID-19 in South Africa, responsible for more than 40%, 45% of all of the COVID-19 deaths that have transpired since the start of the pandemic. When the Delta variant wave started, we still did not have a rollout of COVID-19 vaccines to the general population. The only vaccines that were available was courtesy of Glenda Gray and her group that became available to healthcare workers, the J&J vaccine. The high-risk individuals that could have benefited from a vaccine that we had on home soil basically were left unprotected. So the cost of not using 1.5 million doses of vaccine in high-risk individuals, even a single dose of vaccine would have conferred 80 to 90% protection against the Delta variant, summates to the loss of 20,000 lives. That is what happened when we decided to sell off the AstraZeneca vaccine that was actually available to us. So the future trajectory of COVID-19. Now, when it comes to modeling, I think that no one better than that captures uh, where we are with COVID-19 and the modeling uh, that's taken place. And that is uh, George Bob, known as the father of modeling. And what he's got to say about modeling is that remember that all models are wrong. The practical question is how wrong do they have to be not to be useful? And I think COVID-19 has been a classical example of the number of papers that have gone into high ranking journals, Nature, NEGM and everything else. And when you go back to 2021, 2020, even now in 2022, uh, they've been spectacularly wrong. And not always to the fault of the model, but sometimes due to the fault of the model, such as in the UK recently with the Omicron wave, where they were still estimating that the number of people that were going to die during the course of the Omicron wave was going to far exceed anything else that they experienced. And that was one of the reasons why they closed their borders to Southern Africa, right? which was a complete miscalculation because they didn't factor in something as simple as what we had already learned with the beta variant. And that is, you might have all of these mutations, but at the same time, you're going to have some level of persistence of protection against what matters most, and that is protecting against severe disease and death. So as we all know, we then experienced Omicron wave in South Africa starting on 25th of November, 2021, uh, very much displayed the Delta variant wave and what has transpired since then. Now, for once, uh, this time around with the evolution of a new variant, government didn't go back to its default position of shutting down the economy and shutting down the country with the evolution of a new variant, despite all of the danger signs, danger signs that were being sounded by scientists about this is being a very different type of a virus, much more transmissible, more likely to evade uh, antibody responses, and probably more likely to cause a larger number of people to die of COVID-19. This time around, government actually took a step back and decided not to go to a higher level of restrictions. What was the consequence of that? Now, just this is data from Gauteng. At the start of the Omicron wave, despite the vaccine program now having been in place for more than six months, the number of people in Gauteng, adults, that have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine was around about one third of the population. Uh, people above the age of 50, who's, uh, where we were supposed to have vaccinated 100% uh, of them in a space of two months in the start of the vaccine program, 60% of them had received at least a single dose of a COVID-19 vaccine at the start of the Omicron wave. People that were unvaccinated, the seropositivity data I showed you previously, if you were vaccinated, unsurprisingly, you would have a much higher seropositivity rate, around about 93%. If you were unvaccinated, your seropositivity in adults was 70%. Again, emphasizing that before the onset of the Omicron wave, 70% of people had developed protection against severe disease and death for all intents and purposes, using antibody as a proxy for underlying T-cell immunity against COVID-19. What did we experience? Now, what we experienced was a dramatic decoupling of infections and severe disease and death. So what this uh, data show you, the percentage basically indicates a percentage of the number of cases since the start of the pandemic in that particular wave. The number in parentheses indicates an incidence per 100,000. So three important aspects. Firstly, the Omicron wave was of a much shorter duration of time. And there's a reason for that from the more recent, uh, from some recent publication. And that is because infection, previous infection, probably works as well, if not better, than two doses of the messenger RNA vaccine in an absence of hybrid immunity. 
So infection seems to be working quite well in protecting against reinfection, probably even better than two doses of the messenger RNA vaccine in the absence of a person having been previously infected, and I'll show you that data. And that could have contributed to basically a much uh, more shorter duration for this particular wave. But in addition to that, what we saw most impressively is when it comes to mortality. The death rate during the course of the Omicron wave in Gauteng was less, contributed to less than 5% of all of the deaths that transpired since the start of the pandemic. The number of people that died during the course of the Delta variant wave in Gauteng contributed to 50%, 50% of all of the deaths that occurred since the start of the pandemic. Much of that deaths could have been prevented had the government had its ducks in a row when it came to procuring COVID-19 vaccines and rolling out the vaccines that it had available rather than selling of those vaccines to other countries. So what do we know about COVID-19 vaccines and Omicron? Again, data from discovery that Glenda was part of, we know that the variant is antibody evasive. So unsurprisingly, what we find is that the effectiveness of the vaccine against symptomatic infection is lower compared to the effectiveness of the vaccine against the Delta variant, as an example, decreasing from 80% to 33%. In addition to which, what we've also learned is that uh, it's not just uh, about the AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. All of the different vaccines, when looking at the antibody activity that's induced by the vaccine in relation to its neutralizing activity against Omicron, the substantial fallout of the antibody response, be it from vaccines or also be it just because of past infection due to another variant, where you've got more than a 44 reduction in neutralizing antibody activity. And this neutralizing antibody activity is important in the context of preventing infection, but probably less relevant in the context of preventing severe disease and death. So we've seen a situation where basically we are dealing with the variant that caused a large number of breakthrough infections as well as reinfections. But at the same time, we saw this decoupling. And the reason for this decoupling essentially is because of the relative preservation of the underlying T cell immunity that is induced not just by vaccines, but also by past infection, where you don't have loss of more than 10 to 15% of the T cell responses. Now, what they've also shown in South Africa in an initial, in an initial phase is that yes, the vaccines were less effective in protecting against severe disease uh, due to Omicron compared to the Delta variant, uh, decreasing from effectiveness of 90% to 70%. Uh, but then this is a more recent study uh, from Qatar. And Qatar has been in, producing some really interesting data. So what do they show? Very similar to what was experienced in South Africa, in that vaccine effectiveness uh, against Omicron basically did, was lower than what was experienced against other variants. The longer period of time after having been vaccinated, the greater the waning of protection against infection, but at the same time, some level of durability of protection against severe disease. And in fact, the protection against severe disease can be boosted for the third dose of the messenger RNA vaccines. But what is also interesting, and this is uh, information that just came out yesterday from Qatar, uh, is now comparing what protection arises from past infection with another virus, another variant against Omicron, relative to the protection conferred by the messenger RNA vaccines. And this is specifically for the messenger RNA vaccine. And what they basically show is that people that have developed immunity from past infection are around about 50% less likely to be infected with Omicron compared to individuals that have developed immunity only from the messenger RNA vaccines. So there's no hybrid immunity at play here. It's largely just vaccine versus past infection. So this opens up a Pandora box and it's something that we need to accept and something that we need to address because it's got implications. And it's certainly got implications in South Africa where 85% of the population have basically developed immunity from infection, 40% of whom have also got added uh, immunity because of vaccine, vaccination, the hybrid immunity that we referred to. And this put the, so why is this important? So when looking at hybrid immunity, unlike the immunity that is induced only by vaccines, or only by past infection, hybrid immunity in fact induces a much greater magnitude of antibody response. And that is able to overcome some of the antibody evasiveness of uh, Omicron, resulting in a situation that people with hybrid immunity theoretically will be less likely to become infected with the virus and consequently also less likely to transmit the virus onward. So in South Africa, inadvertently and at huge cost of life, at a huge cost of life, 300,000 people having died, we're ending up with a large percentage of the population which have been vaccinated actually also having hybrid immunity. So we need to learn to look at the virus. Uh, and then 
in 2020, we were talking about what are the non-pharmacological interventions that we need to adhere to. Which of these still remain relevant? Uh, the short answer is that none of them re remain relevant in the context of COVID. Can hygiene is still an important practice in preventing other diseases, but not in preventing COVID-19? Physical distancing is a mindless exercise when we know that a major mode of uh, transmission of the virus is through the airborne route, and what counts is ventilation and not the space between people. I'm equally likely to infect someone sitting at the back of the, uh, at the, back of the auditorium than someone in front with just poor ventilation before the virus spreads. Yeah, physical distancing, wearing it together, face mask. I'm glad none of us are wearing face masks indoors. Uh, going against the regulations, but actually a very bright thing to do. And one of us, are, sorry. Uh, and the reason for that is that the reality is that the type of face mask that 99% of South Africans wear does not protect you against infection and does not prevent you from transmitting the virus in the environment. If you want to do that, you need to use the right type of face mask, which is an N95 face mask, which has got a tight seal around your nose and your mouth which makes it uncomfortable to wear that face mask. And then you know that you're wearing the right type of face mask. And that is not the face mask that you're wearing. And that face mask has been working. We wouldn't have had 80, 85% of the population being infected with the virus at least once in two years. So the pretense of doing something when we're achieving absolutely nothing and doing more harm than any good is something we need to seriously reflect on. And that is where we stand. Over the past week, the Department of Health decided to use a document known as the Notifiable Medical Conditions, which when I was at the NICD, we worked extremely hard to get this NMC document in place. Eventually, it was accepted by the Department of Health. The Department of Health has taken the same document and tried to insert into it clauses which are incomprehensible, incoherent, irrational, with very little other purpose than to pretend that they're still trying to prevent infections due to COVID-19. We are not in a setting where we're wanting to prevent infections because we failed dismally, and we're not going to succeed by trying to recirculate the same sort of regulations that have failed in the past. In addition to which, we don't need to be preventing infections right at this point in time any longer, where there's extensive protection against severe disease and death. So in conclusion, I was asked to reflect, and these are my personal reflections, obviously, uh, but we need to understand that we set out on a certain mission and the goal initially was about preventing infections and about minimizing death. With three quarters and more of the population have been infected with the virus, we have not prevented infections in the past two years. With a mortality rate of 500 per 100,000, we have not done well when it comes to limiting the number of people that have died of COVID-19. We need to recalibrate. And this recalibration, recalibration should have taken place a long, long time ago, before the onset of the Omicron wave. At that stage, we were already indicating that there was very little value for ongoing restrictions in the South African context, because there was very little threat to healthcare facilities being overwhelmed, which is the only reason why restrictions should be imposed, to try to spread the period of time over which the same sort of hospitalizations would materialize. We've had a major impact on healthcare services, and the consequences of that are yet to materialize. The neglect when it comes to chronic disease, management of chronic diseases, the neglect when it comes to underdiagnosis of people with TB, but, uh, interruption of treatment for HIV, those consequences are yet to materialize, and those will materialize in the next few years. We need to address the issues of the economic devastation that's been caused, the social damage that's been caused, the damage that's been caused to children in terms of their future. So current COVID vaccines still provide an opportunity for mitigating this. I'm not saying that there's still no role for vaccines. Like I said, the booster dose, especially in high-risk individuals, can increase that protection against the disease from 70% to 90%. But we don't need to be indiscriminate about who we vaccinate. It needs to be goal-directed. The aspiration towards a 70% coverage of 40 million uh, people in South Africa being, being vaccinated, that aspiration was doomed to fail. It has failed, and it's absolutely no longer relevant because we've already got 80 to 85% of the population that have developed immunity against severe disease courtesy of natural infection. So why do we still follow on trying to achieve a 70% coverage? Is it because WHO says so? Um, it's unclear to me, but there's absolutely no reason that point in time, 70% was geared towards trying to bring about a reduction in transmission and the great possibility of herd immunity, which is no longer an option either. So further resurgences are likely, and further variants are very likely as well. But if we have a variant that is able to evade the T-cell immunity, for all intents and purposes, not dealing with COVID-19 any longer, then we are dealing with COVID-22 and COVID-23. Because the ability of the virus up till now to evade T cell immunity has been nominal, and even less so in the context of a setting where the majority of immunity has been induced 
by virtue of natural infection, because the depth of T cell responsiveness and T cell immunity with natural infection is much more is superior compared to the depth of immune responses that's induced by vaccines. So apologies for being a bit over time, but thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Shabir, for a, a very entertaining talk, um, particularly with Zapero. We're going to save questions um, for the end of the next session, and Shabir will be part of that. I would like to invite um, Professor Ames Dyer to come and give a short overview of the book. Um, Ames is well known, uh, particularly for her um, role as the director of the Steve Biko Center for Bioethics. And um, thanks to Ames and Bioethics and law are part of the health sciences education. Um, Ames, over to you. You can see I've forgotten Senate, uh, the Senate room. So uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Dania. And I'm just going to do a very, very quick uh, overview of the book. It's not moving. Apologies about that, uh, but I think we're ready to continue now. And just, just some thoughts before I do the overview of the book, just some quick thoughts on why we decided on putting together the book. Uh, at, we sat there at the beginning of the pandemic thinking about why we were in the situation, looking at the history of pandemics and realized that since the 16th century there's been uh, at least three pandemics per century and these were between 10 to 50 year intervals and then looked at the 21st century and saw that the uh, epidemics and pandemics had actually started increasing in frequency. And that was because of technology being a double-edged sword. With technology, we had travel, trade, urbanization, and of course, urban degradation and climate change. And all this led to this increased frequency of pandemics. And then we looked at generally what happened every time we had an endemic or a pandemic. 
and how did society actually respond to this? And initially it was immense interest, like we all actually did at the beginning of the pandemic. And then there was horror and there was panic. And we all shared that horror and pandemic. And then we found that at the end of almost every pandemic that we've had, uh, once everything settled down, there was dispassionate disinterest. And Martin, Dania, and I said to each other, we can't let this happen after the COVID-19 pandemic. We've actually got to do something to make sure that we, we, you know, we take the lessons learned from this pandemic and work towards pandemic preparedness because we're going to get another pandemic close on the heels of this pandemic. We were very concerned at that stage because all countries were unprepared. It wasn't just South Africa. If you look at Japan, who was the leader in the Health Olympics, Japan was unprepared. And so were Sweden and Norway, the United States and South Africa. And none of the countries, including the countries with the best run healthcare, actually had adequate public health structures to, uh, to confront uh, this, this pandemic that we were facing. But I think what really irked us most was the political response. And Professor Mahdi has actually taken us through this political response. The poor and inconsistent messaging, the illogical decision-making, and you know what, COVID-19, and we could see it within this country, was actually used to drive political agendas globally and at home as well. And corruption, like we'd never seen before, people actually exploited, government exploited the pandemic uh, in its corruption agenda. And our politicians were so socially removed from the ground. When our president announced the first lockdown, the full lockdown, what did he say? He consulted widely. He consulted widely with business and activists. We did not hear him say that he consulted with the poor on the ground, with civil society. And we know what happened because of his lack of consultation. And unfortunately, the lack of consultation is because our political leaders are really socially removed from the people that they profess to govern. Uh, we had our social responses then. We had a whole lot of misinformation coming through and deliberate disinformation. Our academics respond, responded as well. Many of our academics worked in their laboratories, uh, you know, and worked towards addressing the issues uh, that, that, that we saw with the pandemic. But we also saw publication marathon. And we saw a number of papers being published, peer reviewed, non peer reviewed, retractions. And this all led to that infodemic of pandemic proportions and the panic demic that actually uh, went hand in hand with it. And we saw vulnerability increasing, being made worse. And where there wasn't vulnerability, vulnerability appeared for the first time. And there was so much uncertainty as well. So the three of us decided, look, we need to put together a tool a resource which would serve as lessons learned towards pandemic preparedness and also towards how we could continue with management of the pandemic. This tool needed to assist us as we go forward with this pandemic. And we felt that when you looked at the WHO definition of health, a state of total well-being, uh, physical, mental, social, not just the absence of disease and infirmity. We needed that multidisciplinary team. We needed people not only 
uh, from the health sciences, but we needed our legal heads, we needed our economists, we needed people from media, and we needed people from ethics and human rights as well. So we got together and put this multidisciplinary team, and you can see we have most of them from WITS, experts in whatever they do, um, some from outside WITS and some from outside the country as well. So we got a global team together and we put together this book, which is made up of two sections. And the first 14 are generic and uh, generic to general health science related issues, social determinants of health, etc. Uh, and the next 10 are specific, they're technical, they're clinical, and they give specific guidance on how to actually handle the pandemic going forward. Our book is dedicated to our South African healthcare practitioners and healthcare practitioners globally that have been treating patients infected by COVID-19. And the circumstances have been very difficult during this time, but our healthcare practitioners actually went forward and put pa the patient first. Uh, many of them, several of them actually succumbed during this time. We've also had several colleagues that have helped in managing this pandemic on a policy and implementation level. And some of their actions have actually been critical uh, in the South African and the global response. And others have actually done so by speaking truth to power. And we thank them for their contributions as well. We also want to acknowledge some of our colleagues who have assisted with disseminating honest, objective information during this time, uh, especially the science journalists who went and educated themselves on the issue and took forward evidence-based factual information, put it into lay language and got this out to the public at large. I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, those that assisted us with the book. Uh, I want to start off with acknowledging Juta for believing in us, believing in our vision. And I must tell you, I've written book proposals before. I, I have not had such a rapid response uh, to a proposal that I had when we submitted to Juta. So we really thank Juta for taking that risk on us. I want to thank all the authors, many of them who were infected by the, uh, by the virus uh, or had personal losses or both. And we started off the book uh, towards the latter half of 2020. We had some delays because of uh, various reasons, people being infected, personal losses, etc. But we managed to complete the book. Uh, the authors worked against time, in, you know, in terms of ensuring they completed their chapters. And the book was then launched on the 9th of December last year. We had two external reviews, one from South Africa, uh, and one from the US, Professor J.P. van Liekerk from Cape Town and Kayum Ahmed from, uh, the United, uh, from New York. Uh, so we want to thank them for their helpful reviews, which we used to actually uh, enrich the chapters even further. I, we'd like to thank the South African Medical Research Council and in particular, Professor Glenda Gray, who we used as a sounding board uh, and we often bounced questions off her. And while there wasn't a formal collaboration, there was an informal collaboration with the Medical Research Council when we actually put together the book. So thank you, Glenda. And of course, we'd like to thank Professor Lynn Morris, who has been supportive of the book ever since she saw the book or heard of it. And she was there with us during the first launch of the book. 
and she she supported the idea of of getting the authors together and getting them to highlight the work that we do. Today we're showcasing our authors, not all authors, but authors that have been managed uh, have managed to actually attend. And uh, even the authors aren't able to present their, their work, they're going to be chairing. So thank you to the authors as well. Martin, I hand over to you. Great, thank you very much, Ames. And it's a great pleasure then to immediately um, introduce Mark Grodman, who is a physician, entrepreneur, and innovator, um, who has been based with um, a number of the colleagues at Columbia University and has co-authored um, one of the chapters um, in this book. Is Mark available? Yeah, I think. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, hi, Mark. Okay. Nice to hear you. Good to meet um, all of you. I let me uh, let me get started, okay? Yeah, just one second, Mark. I think we've got some problem with your sound. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Can you hear? Am I clear? Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, I want to thank everybody. Everyone need, needs to be congratulated on this incredible effort that's been put forth. Also, I want to thank all the people who arranged the logistics of this program. They certainly have had their challenges today, um, and I appreciate the opportunity. There are going to be many recurrent themes today that we're going to hear, and many words that we're going to hear. We're going to hear about vulnerability. We're going to hear about uncertainty. We, not the professional world, the public do not like uncertainty. They don't expect us to present this. And the one thing that COVID has done is certainly been able to make us aware that uncertainty lives in all of our lives. The other part about preparedness, about no one was prepared, entities, countries, we still are not because we're humbled by all the different sequelae of this horrible pandemic. This chapter that we did really revolves around two basic themes. One was to talk about the ecosystem. There are a lot of great organizations, wonderful organizations that create the global health ecosystem. And sometimes, and what we do in the chapter is just to quickly review how they work. And a review of them kind of show both the challenges, you know, the capabilities, the intent, but also the challenges that we have ahead. We talk about the World Health Organization, which is the main governance structure that we have today to be able to deal with issues about global health, a technical organization providing supplies personnel and really being the overseer of crises that are going to be that we deal with worldwide and are able to go in and make policy recommendations. But the WHO, even being our de facto main governance body, still has multiple vulnerabilities themselves, not the least of which is funding, which is characterized in two different ways. That which is specified or assessed, and that which is which is um, well that which is assessed and that which is for specific purposes. And the amount of assessed funding, meaning funding that could be used as WHO sees fit, has gone from 80% of its budget to 20%. That changes the makeup of what we're able to appreciate. We know about Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, which in itself is a collaboration between the Gates Foundation, the WHO, UNICEF, and the World Bank, that has been the primary funder of the COVAX initiative, to be able to provide vaccines worldwide, which in itself has been, along with the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, a large part of the ACT or the Access to COVID tools, which has been able to go in and be a large part of providing vaccines all over the world. We know of CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness. It really works mostly on research and development, both for improving existing vaccines, as well as to be able to deal with newer emerging vaccines and problems that may come out. We understand about the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board created in 2018 at the behest of the UN to deal with potential outbreaks. We understand UNICEF dealing mostly with 
being able to work dedicated to children, but be able to go in and deal not only with public health measures, but also to be able to do with continuity care for children on all conditions, whether they be water, sanitation, hygiene, and has become the major instrument for the implementation of childhood vaccine vaccinations. We have the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, which has been a huge aid to be able to go in, not only in fighting AIDS, TB, and malaria, but it's also has diverted multiple funds to be able to be able to fight vaccines and COVID-19. It's a lot of organizations. You need a scorecard. Many of them have cross-pollinated. And what I wanted to convey with this is that many of them work in pieces. And when you think about where we are, what calls out is the integration. That remains a challenge. Years ago, WHO created the International Health Regulations, the IHR, that was meant to be able to go in and primarily with two functions, be able to look at public health emergencies and come up with some guidelines to be able to go in and understand how you're able to go deal with compliance, how you can deal with different kinds of public health emergencies. In the first part, they clearly have fulfilled their role, picking out the H1N1 swine flu, the Ebola virus in West Africa, Zika, um, and being able to highlight where public emergencies exist. But the IHR in itself had very little compliance over the years, which called for in 2014, the creation of the Global Health Security um, Action Group, or the agenda that was able to go in and take a better look at saying, okay, let's go in and be able to find out who is prepared and what are the means to know whether there is readiness, which resulted in the mechanism to do a scorecard under the Joint External Evaluation System, which countries underwent to be able to look at their preparedness. That was first lost by the WHO, and other organizations have gone in and have now characterized and created that scorecard. What's critical is that a lot of the evaluations that we did in the JEE did not do justice to what happened with COVID. In a recent article in The Lancet in February, a remarkable study looked at how well JE predicted COVID outbreaks, the devastation, infections, fatalities, and found out that there really was very little correlation between JEE scores and some of those, and some of those determinants. Noting that infection had far more to do with GDP, altitude, seasonality, and fatality had more to do with age, BMI, and the wealth of the countries. But more importantly, and these are themes that others will talk about, trust. Trust in institutions, trust in government, trust to be able to implement those measures that are critical. The second point of the part of what we talk about is to take a look at the four elements, if you will, of global health security, the, the four means by which we are gonna be able to look at ways to be able to go in and address pandemics. There are four major pillars. I'm not gonna go into all of them in detail. Therapeutics is one. And just to be able to follow up on something, the role of therapeutics that it's played in COVID is clearly is not terribly clear at this point. But what is? is the remarkable collaboration of the medical community to be able to go in and spread knowledge. Think about where we were in simple terms about how to deal with respirators, physicians, steroids, anticoagulants. The ability over the first few months for the medical community worldwide in peer review articles to be able to get as much information as you can was able to do more than maybe any other effect to be able to change the course of lives outside of the eventuality of vaccines. Vaccines, more is gonna be spoken about. We will have a symposium at Columbia called Unfinished Business on COVID vaccines next week. And there's been without any question, remarkable effort. Yet still, there are challenges that remain, not the least of which 
are two overwhelming areas. One, equity, that we are not safe until the world is vaccinated. And two, acceptance, being able to have people be able to accept and be able to implement vaccines. And then we're faced with other challenges, both going to be implementation, as well as how we deal with new variants. I want to talk for a second on diagnostics because I've lived in most of this world my whole life. We've learned about diagnostics. We started at ground zero, where all we had was PCR, not a technology to be able to go in and do rapid turnaround, nor big volumes of testing. We've learned. Lord knows in the United States, we learned. But what we've also learned with COVID is that for a test to be valuable, you need to know why you are doing it. Are you doing a diagnostic test to know whether someone has it, meaning they present with symptoms? Or are you doing it to be able as a screening test, to accept admittance, to show infectivity? Those are different requirements on development. It changes what we do. And the onset and the time of developing at home and rapid tests is a large part to be answered the second goal and not as much for the first. So diagnostics itself for every, any pathogen that comes out needs to be looked at as to what we want to get out of the test. The last point I want to just mention in terms of these different pillars is surveillance. And I don't think there is any area that is more important and more challenged and still yet to be defined. How do decision makers know what's important? In the United States early on, people in Washington, decision makers would often say, how do we know where the problem is? We are relying on measures on ICU rates, resp people on respirators in hospitals. That's how we knew disease severity. Testing. Testing relies on one, the ability to get a test, and two, of reporting the result, which at various times had value. And now, as we got on into Omicron, with the advent of at-home tests, there was very little reporting. Wastewater, absolutely important, not fully implemented. For the future, how do we know where there are going to be new pathogens that come out, identifying them and what they're going to be? Surveillance of new variants. I, I've lived in a good deal of my life in the area of genomics. There is no correlation between sequencing capacity and how you use sequencing. In the United States, we did not do well. We didn't live in central sequencing facilities. So we often fell behind in being able to pick up new variants where countries like South Africa, like others, had a mechanism to do this. And in this case, sequencing, and like other diagnostic tests, are not used to diagnose a disease, but by looking for variants. The point is that it's not the capabilities. It's not the static look of what we may get out of what we see over with static grades. It's how you use them. It's how they interact. In this chapter, we talk about a few recommendations. We talk about the establishment of a permanent unit in the office of the UN Secretary General to monitor and coordinate responses to high consequences of infectious diseases. We have to be able to strengthen the global preparedness monitoring board, strengthen the role of UNICEF in caring for children, strengthening the role of WHO, in being able to deal with public good and avoid nationalistic um, issues. I want to move back and deal with three issues that I think are important. It's not static capability. We've learned that. Countries that have done great eight months ago are having issues now. It's important to be able to do coordination, how they work together. Trust is important. How you build trust for the government, for the entities are critical. And finally, is the larger issue that I reviewed quickly is governance. We still don't live in a world where these emerging threats are really dealt with in a reasonable fashion. 
There are important organizations, well-meaning, who all work on solutions. Until we find some way to deal with some kind of global clearinghouse and governance that has the faith of both public and private partnerships, we're still going to leave a lot of solutions on the table. Anyway, I hope I didn't run over. Thank you for the time. And I hand it back over to uh, Ameson for the next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Grodman. And we will join you, or you will be joining us again a little bit later for questions. I would like to welcome um, Alex van der Heerfe, who's actually an economist, but he's had a, a career in health economics. Um, he's from the Witt School of Governance and has done a lot of work in medical aids, but he's also been part of um, several commissions, um, such as the Malamud Commission on Medical Schemes, as well as the Ministerial Task Team on Social Health Insurance, as well as the health market inquiry. Um, welcome, Alex. The, the chapter that I was focusing on in this, uh, in this talk dealt with um, corruption leadership, essentially, and the, uh, essentially the, the corrosion of the public health system as a material factor in South Africa's inability to deal effectively with both health care in general, as well as this, this particular pandemic. And what was quite coincidental about this pandemic was that I'd been given virtually that topic to write a chapter in a book that was finalized in November 2019, in which I was assessing South Africa's preparedness for dealing with epidemics um, uh, uh, going forward, I had no idea about COVID coming, and really had no benchmarks to kind of assess South Africa against. And so the methodology for that assessment looked at um, looking at proxy indicators of capability. And uh, I used at that point certain of our performance indicators, such as outcome indicators, the um, internal mortality ratios, our assessments of our hospitals, Office of Health Standards compliance, somewhat dodgy evaluations, and the, uh, as well as the Auditor General's reviews of the provincial departments. And out of those, my sort of overriding conclusion was that South Africa would fail abysmally in dealing with any kind of major epidemic facing South Africa. And um, now what would be unclear is exactly what kind of problems you would face. And I think it's worthwhile trying to specify that, to indicate what kind of problem you would deal with with a pandemic like this. Um, and it kind of comes out in the, in the talk that Shabia gave earlier. One of the most important things you would deal with is making coherent decisions under conditions of uncertainty. That's the key challenge our institutions of health faced and the government as a whole faced we would not have sufficient evidence to be absolutely clear about whether or not what we were doing would be absolutely correct. But we would have to make decisions anyway. If you have a, a, a weak, uh, a, a low capability state and a low capability system, you're going to make the wrong decisions under conditions of uncertainty because they're incredibly difficult to make. And, uh, and the one key example that was given earlier of saying, no, we're waiting for further evidence before we decide whether or not to roll out a particular vaccine. That in itself was quite clearly insane under those conditions. Now, that particular decision is not the only insane decision that has been made in the health system over the last 20 years. That's just one of many. And the question is, why are the decisions so systematic why can you almost predict that when a choice is made between doing something reasonably sensible under conditions of uncertainty and doing something stupid, we will make the stupid decision? And uh, the issue is that the, it is systematic. 
it is not a, uh, a coincidence. It's not, it's not something that is unpredictable at this stage. It clearly flows from the way in which the governance framework in South Africa was organized at this point in time. And it, what we've seen in this pandemic is very much a, uh, as we've seen with the Zondo Commission, something that we should be deeply concerned about. Um, there's a nice story, um, for those of you who are young to watch World at War, and there was one very interesting interview with Lord Mountbatten at that point in time. He was commander of a battleship in the Pacific, and it got sunk by a Japanese submarine. And he's sort of sitting in the water covered in oil, and a sort of lowly um, sailor is, is sitting next to him, and he sort of says to Lord Mountbatten, um, who, was, who was the commander of the battleship, he says, it's amazing how the scum sinks to the surface. And kind of that's, that's very much the problem we're dealing with in organizations and systems. It's basically trying to make sure that the scum doesn't sink to the surface. And to do that, you need to have organizations designed to make sure that the right kind of people end up in the decision-making positions. So the question is, why are we systematically getting the wrong kind of person into decision-making positions? Well, one of the starting points to look at, which we've seen as a litmus test, and maybe just to start with that, the PPE scandal that we see was 100% predictable up front. Um, I was in discussions with uh, National Treasury as we went in in March, late March, April, to say, protect those procurement processes. And they were coming back and saying, we can't. And the, that was the predictability of it, but the fact that they couldn't stop it tells you a lot. Now, why it became so prevalent is because, in fact, much of South Africa's health system and much of South Africa's state has actually been wired to do that. It's no accident. So there's two types of corruption that you can look at, and it's a proxy indicator for performance. Two types of corruption. I would have to sort of the bottom feeder corruption where somebody tries to steal something from the organization one way or another, but it's not officially sanctioned. And then you've got the officially sanctioned corruption. That's the top-down corruption. That's the state capture process. And that typically involves the top echelons of government. And it can only happen if there is capturability built into the system. Capturability essentially means that you're allowed, you're positioned to make sure that you appoint every single person around an accountability framework for decision making, for procurement, for licensing, for anything where you're a gatekeeper on major, major sources of revenue or, um, or, or economic value in society. If you're in a position to do that, you've concentrated power. And in fact, nobody can hold you to account because you are accountable only to yourself. Now, why is that allowed? Why is that permitted? How, does, how is that possible in, in the South African health system and in much of the state in South Africa? It largely arises through political appointments into what would essentially be administrations, agencies, key functions of the state, where there are legislative powers that have to be carried out, where massive procurement is required. And in those institutions, if you've got all you have to do to capture a major part of government or the state is to capture the relevant political party that's coordinating the appointments. Essentially, the, co co the co coordination happens behind the scenes. And we've had years for this to slowly feed in to basically the way our, our system is designed. And the fact that we have, at this point in time, virtually everybody is pretty sure which ministers are responsible for corruption in South Africa. Not one of them, only one, is potentially being prosecuted at this point in time. There's potentially enough evidence, they've done enough for you to know where these problems are occurring. When you look at the Auditor General's reports, you can see that the levels of irregular expenditure, which can only occur if people are not following procurement procedures, are so high that you would be sending in teams of investigators into that department to find out what's going on, but you barely have a response from government. It's there. So there is something wrong with the accountability framework. So the issue now, now the, what's important is that corruption is only a proxy indicator of failed performance. It's just one manifestation of failure. The other manifestations of failure are when you just fail to do your job. Respond to a pandemic. 
fix a hospital. Make sure that there are no stockouts. Make sure that you're continuously improving your hospital and primary care services, integrating your functions, continuously finding ways to do things better than we did last year. That's your job. If you have this part of the system failing, you have major performance failures and corruption is just one aspect, one feature of it that is driving the appointments in government. So part of the problem of corruption itself is that it is potentially part of a system of patronage in which both appointments and procurements are part of a political game. Now, when people talk about politics in South Africa, it's not the correct use of the term. They think just because you're talking about a politician, you're talking about politics. Politics is about governance. Politics is about the social contract. It's connecting what we do socially in government to what we do, have we, what we get as social goods and services that can't be provided by a private sector or system. Those decisions are part of a social contract. Once the fabric of, the, uh, of governance, once governance is destroyed and politics is destroyed, then you fail the social contract is gone. And at that point, the decisions made by governments have nothing to do with the needs of society. We're seeing that in Russia today. So the, the issue is performance is very much a function of how politics should work. It's that's when you're connecting the social contract, connecting society to the decisions of government. If that fails, they fail to fail to have that, you fail at, at a performance level. If the system is designed correctly, so you do not have political appointments and all of our agencies and organizations of the state, of the, of the public system, of anything, and, and, and we've seen it in every organization that's worked in South Africa, is that where those appointments are based on merit, based on people who can do those jobs and that are, they are screened from the patronage process, you have performance. So essentially those are the things we need to change. And the problem at this point in time is that so much of the state and so much of the public system, the public health system to date, including all regulators and including all the agencies, uh, all the other agencies of the state are subject and vulnerable to the political appointment process, which destroys their the integrity of their decision making. And it pretty much ensures that it's going to be only in very rare cases that leadership actually, uh, the scum doesn't sink to the surface. So um, what do you want out of organizations? going forward is that they need to be agile and highly capable. One of the things about having to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty is you might need to change direction quickly and you're not totally prepared for it. Very capable organizations can do that. They're now confronted with something they didn't predict and they make reasonably good decisions and choices as they move into that. We actually saw that in many institutions in South Africa and around, around the world. We just didn't see it in government. Um, and in fact, what you want to do is to convert organizations into that kind of structure. And the question is, what are the preconditions? What establishes, what creates organizations like that? Well, the one is that the corporate governance design, if we're dealing with public institutions, must be, must be able to hold a senior executive to account for the mandate that it's got. It must be screened from political decisions, must not involve patronage and, um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, in, and, and build in a what often referred to as dynamic capability to, to the organization, which means making sure that you actually decentralize a lot of the, of the organizational decisions if they're very large. Um, but I'll finish really on the point of decentralization as a concept, which is very important. You think that decentralization atomizes systems and organizations. It doesn't. It essentially allows you to make a, a wide array of autonomously responsible for the decisions they make for organizations um, and parts of organizations they are responsible for. You want those people to be who are in charge of those aspects of a system or organization to be the captains of their, of their own ship. Now, uh, I'm going to give one example just to finish off, which is the, the Charlotte period experience that we've just had. Very unusual situation that we have in South Africa, that a, that a CEO of a hospital in South Africa in the public sector is not the captain of their ship. They're very often a political appointment. They're very not necessarily capable of managing their organization. That's extremely complex. And they don't have all the powers to run that organization. They don't have the authority. They don't have the accountability structures. They don't have any of that. 
So when you actually build or repair a hospital that you're responsible for, another department in South Africa and the Greek province has been responsible for that. And there are, uh, and we have building after building that has failed in the, in the Gauteng Department of Health um, over time. And one example being when we, that the head office of the Department of Health went down. It's, it's an astounding fact that that is one of, the, one of the situations that we have. But what was interesting is that the head of the Department of Health had no responsibility for the maintenance of the building they were sitting in. But when they all had to be farmed out to all of the different office spaces within the provincial government to find them somewhere to be, um, a bunch of them found themselves in the head office of the Department of Infrastructural Development which when there was a survey now of whether or not the buildings were safe in the provincial health department, it was found that the head office of, head office of the Department of Infrastructural Development responsible for fixing Charlotte was not a safe building to be in. This is just absolutely astounding, but it is part of the fragmentation of decision-making that arises from poor designs because people aren't focused on delivering public value and not land work. They've got another agenda, and that's what has to change. So I'll finish there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex, and we are going to undoubtedly explore some of those ideas. Now it's my great, uh, great pleasure to introduce Mia Milan, who I must say has been absolutely spectacular in this, this period of time. We've all read um, what she's had to say. Um, just very quickly, some formal introductions, um, much awarded journalist and currently the editor-in-chief of the Fakisa um, Center of um, Health Journalism. We have a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. We can discuss it later. Good afternoon, everyone. Is this is this sound good? Um, I'm pretty sure I've gone through the lineup, and I'm pretty sure I'm the only person who's not a doctor or a professor here today. <laughs> so you've got to listen to me. So I'm just a good old journalist, and I work through literature on what really is the role of the media, the news media specifically, during pandemics. Now, before we can look at the role, we of course need to see what is the news media. And that's so confusing today because there's social media and there's all forms of competing media. But generally, people agree that when it's the news media, there's some sort of form of structure that helps ensure in a news office that information come out accurately. It doesn't always come out accurately, but there's some structure that tries to help ensure this. And when you compare that to something just like social media, there's no, there, there's no moderation as to what goes out. Anyone can just tweet what they want. So generally in a, in a news organization, you will present a story at a news meeting. There will be a sub editor, an editor that tries that, that, that story that has to go through that structure and somehow um, that will help you to have a more accurate story. And then what do people want from news? Now there is a digital news report that comes out each year that's done by the Reuters Institute for the study for the advancement of journalism at Oxford University. It's a little bit like the health barometer of health systems trust that comes out each year. It's like a barometer of the media. From that survey consistently, it comes out that people want pretty simple things from the media. They want the news to keep them up to date, to help them to understand what is going on and to keep an eye on those in positions of power. 
So the big question is, does the media influence public health responses? Does it have the ability to do that during a pandemic? And there's many, many studies that shows absolutely yes. And one of the main reasons for that is because of its extraordinary reach. It reaches masses of people. So what the media say, whether it's right or wrong or accurate or inaccurate, has a huge influence on how people think about issues and what they think about. And the media does that by angling a story around a certain angle, and it makes choices as to who they quote and who they don't quote. That's why you'll see publications with different views or different lines that they take, and that influences their consumers as to how they think about issues. So during pandemics, the media can do many things, but two very important things. It can play a very big role as to whether their consumers adhere to government regulations. And that becomes quite complex when the science is still involving and the media struggles as to what is right and what is wrong. And secondly, it can have a huge influence on whether people reject or embrace science. And as an effect, for instance, take up vaccines or reject them, or take up unproven treatments like avamectin or chloroquine. So, in my opinion, there's two main roles for the media during pandemics. The one is to make it possible for people to understand what's happening around them, and that means they science communicators and not just to put accurate information out there. In my, I think accurate information is pretty useless if you just have it there and people don't understand what it means. So as important as accurate information would be to break it down in a form that an average person can make sense out of it. And it's something that you have to consistently do and not just once off so that people consistently understand what's happening around them. And then accountability journalism, Alex van der Nieffe mentioned corruption. There's a huge role for the media to play to make sure that the government um, at least attempts to implement evidence-based measures and also to monitor budget expenditure. As Alex has mentioned, there was the PPE scandal, there was the digital vibe scandal, lots of money. Pandemics have far more money like going around to be corrupt with than in non-pandemic areas. So there's far bigger opportunities for corruption. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenges that there is to get the science right during pandemics for journalists. And the reason I'm not gonna talk about accountability journalism is because if people don't understand the science, so if consumers of media organizations don't understand what evidence is going around and what is the science, they have no tools to hold the government accountable for evidence-based policies because they wouldn't know what to fight for. So one of the biggest challenges during pandemics is that they require specialist journalists just by the nature of a pandemic that's based on science and based on health issues. And if you look at the survey, there were many surveys done during the pandemic, but one such survey showed that only 4% of COVID reporters were health reporters. And that makes it very, very challenging for media organizations to not just get things right, but to frame it within the right context. And the more important thing even is that almost not a single organization had a health editor, especially in developing and that's where the quality lies. Someone who can help you to check the accuracy, someone who can help you to, to increase the quality of that story. So it doesn't help if there's a nice health reporter, relatively junior in a news organization, when the news editor has a political or a business background, there's not really help in shaping that story correctly. And that is even more difficult when it comes to fast moving science, as we've seen with COVID. When there's preprints, most journalists had no idea what a preprint was during when that came up during the pandemic. When there's things like SAPRA regulations that I, as a journalist, often find harder to understand than the science. It's, it's a complex thing to understand how do medicines get approved. And the most important thing is you get journalists who don't have contact lists of scientists, which is our saviors during journalists, you know, during, during a pandemic to be able to ask if we don't understand things. 
And a good example is Firil Hafiji, who is a very well-known journalist in the country and a very credible one, um, was in one of our webinars, a webinar that I moderated about what are the challenges for general reporters during pandemics. And she stated the example of Sputnik, the vaccine, that when Russia uh, announced that they had found the first vaccine, and I think it was based on 40 or 50 subjects were still on a phase one or phase two um, trial, and they thought it was true because they had never ever reported on clinical trials before and didn't know there were phases in trials. It didn't go out that story in the end, but it was something that could certainly have happened. Then the second thing is it's very, very hard for the media to know what degree of alarm to sound because science is still developing and the media is particularly bad with communicating uncertainty because it's such a complex um, concept. And Studies show us, as you know better than me, because you are the scientists, that scaremongering can harm public health responses because fear and panic can stigmatize the disease and lead to fewer people getting tested and then as a result of that, taking up treatment. So it's hard to figure out how much do you do, do what is the right amount of scaring to scare people into action or to prevent them from taking action? And what you, words do you use? Do you say COVID kills? Do you say it's deadly? And what effect could that have on people? A good example is during the HIV pandemic, initially everyone said AIDS kills and then it stigmatized people and we got treatment available and it was no longer scientifically accurate to say that. But what do we do with COVID? Is do you treat it differently during the Delta wave with a higher mortality rate than during Omicron? What words do you use? It's hard to figure that out. And then that whole thing of pandemics create infodemics for everyone, but imagine being the media and only 4% of journalists have ever reported on health issues and now have these huge amounts of information becoming available, some of it correct, some of it not correct, and you have to figure out which part of this information do you quote. And that often results in the media amplifying harmful and untrue minority views. And three examples of that is in the UK media, a study showed that only 2% of the UK public affords any credibility or, or any belief in the conspiracy theory that um, 5G mobile phones can signals can transmit SARS-CoV-2. But the media reported on it extensively and as a result, reached people who were in doubt about that, who weren't sure what they thought about it and could have swayed them to the wrong side. It was certainly not just 2% of stories that, that, that focused on that. In the US, we know about Donald Trump, who falsely claimed that, hydro, that, chloro, that hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine can treat or prevent COVID-19. And there were particularly conservative media organizations such as Fox News, who supported Trump and reported on it in very uncritical ways. So we just say what he said, no other information that contradicted it. And then there was an Arizona couple who took chloroquine that you give to use for fish to treat parasites in them and then took it one the husband died in the couple and that was at least partly as a result of the media reporting on these things uncritically and in south africa we had some situations where doctors who supported ivermectin for which there's no credible evidence got sympathetic space in some media organizations, mainstream media organizations where they could write op-eds, where they treated patients, actually some in public hospitals with ivermectin. And that created the impression that there is really like in the med more medical support, more support for it in the medical world than that what there really was. So a doctor who, you know, was irresponsible and treated people with ivermectin should not get the same space as Glenda Gray arguing for the merits of vaccines. It's, it's, it shouldn't be, there's a false equivalency. You shouldn't, you, 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 it shouldn't get the same space. And of course, pandemics happen against backgrounds. And with COVID, it happened against the background where the trust in media was at an all-time all low. So whatever the media said initially about COVID was viewed against that background. So if you were a conspiracy theorist and you thought COVID was made up, there was even more reason for you to view it against that background. Another example would be the HIV pandemic. That happened during the background of we were a new democracy. And if you criticize 
um, the president at the time's HIV denialism, it was often viewed as politically motivated, as not supporting democracy because it happened against that background. And COVID, of course, happened against the background of social media. It's the first large epidemic that happened against a huge social media competition, which is a very effective tool for spreading misinformation. And the media then had to compete against that. And lastly, pandemics have financial and mental health consequences for media organizations. So during a time where you need more specialist journalists, which are more expensive to employ, employ than just general reporters, and where you need more staff, you face a situation like we faced during lockdown, where media houses had to get rid of some staff and had to often, um, the staff that stayed behind had to work for lower salaries. For instance, at the Mail and Guardian, where Bikisisa, where I work, was originally based, people got a third cut in their salaries and they still haven't received that back. So they still work for a two thirds of the salary that they worked for before COVID. And journalists, especially television journalists, have to expose themselves to dangerous um, situations to get stories. So you would have seen like the television stations, people being sent to vaccination sites when they opened up. Um, daily to report from there or areas where there's infections and they then um, develop significant forms of anxiety. So one survey that was done across six countries, including South Africa, found that about a quarter of journalists in 2020 um, had clinical, clinically significant um, symptoms of anxiety and 11% had symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of reporting on COVID. So in the interest of time, there's of course many solutions for this, but I'm just going to look at three. The one obvious thing is if we want to prepare for a next pandemic, we need more specialist journalists. But how do you do that when the media's model the advertising model has collapsed. And the reason it has collapsed is because the media no longer has exclusive access to printing presses with an online revolution. Anyone can take the advertising. So there's less money to sustain media and specialist correspondents are expensive. So where does the money come from if we now know we need more of these people? So one form is donor funded journalism as the place where I work, Bekesisa, it's funded by philanthropists. We're not the only health organization, media organization in South Africa, there's Ground Up, Spotlight, Health E. And such organizations give their copy to mainstream media houses and everyone can essentially use it. What you would really like is a health reporter and a health editor at each media organization. But where the money for that is going to come from, I don't know. If you talk to donors, their argument is we'll rather fund the small media startups that can share their stories with everyone than a health reporter at each organization. Because how do you choose who you get to give the money to? They just don't have enough money for everyone. Something that emerged during this online revolution and also specific, specifically COVID is that there's a hybrid now. It's not just journalists who have to tell the story. People like you can tell stories, can be the journalists because you have printing presses to do that. You have websites, they social media. But the challenge often for scientists is that they don't know how to tell stories that and break scientific concepts down so that people can can understand that. So there are two interesting ways that's, that, that you can do that. There's a fellowship at Stanford University where public health professionals such as yourself can go to for three to six months. They teach you how to tell stories and you get mentored by people like Sanjay Gupta from CNN and then form partnerships with those media houses where you are a commentator, a regular commentator, but you now do it in a way that is very accessible to the public. Or if it's a print publication where you write regular op-eds or you, as, you have partnerships with journalists for stories. And at Bekesisa, where I work, we have had um, one medical student who did his elective, one of his final year electives at Bekesisa, to learn how to, tell, to, 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 to become familiar with storytelling. And we have another final year medical student from UCT who joins us in June. And it's also very beneficial to us because we then have a partnership where we can contact those people afterwards if we don't understand a concept or to write a story together. 
And then training and partnerships, of course. Um, I don't think I, as a journalist, would have survived COVID without having scientists on speed dial. Um, I really gathered many WhatsApp cell phone numbers to be able to, uh, that, and scientists were available like in the middle of the night, I wasn't sure about something. And um, media houses also work together to share their knowledge. So one example of that is at Bekesisa, we had a partnership with News from Africa for the first 18 months of COVID, where we had a daily slot where we would speak about our stories or just break down concepts where um, they argued, we don't have the science journalist and you know because he said they didn't have the television audience and it worked very well together and is something that we can still use so one of the biggest lessons that i learned from COVID is that because you need to have so many more things done in such a short period it's really impossible to do it without partnerships because you need more hands so I've learned as a journalist and in the media world to value those partnerships, whether it's with scientists or with other media houses, working together just makes it more powerful. Thank you, Mia. And I'm now going to ask you to come back. <laughs> can we have, um, we're going to have just a very short panel discussion. Um, so can I ask the speakers in the previous session, so that's Ames, um, I hope we can get Dr. Grudman on the screen, um, Alex, Vanahirta and Mia, just to come to the front. And then um, we'll open the floor for questions, um, if there are any. I see, unfortunately, um, Prof Mahdi's had to leave us. Um, I think there's been a lot of uh, different aspects of the pandemic and lots of um, things for thought. I prefer to use the one with LED lights on now. Uh, don't use them simultaneously. Just press one mic at a time. So, Mia, yeah, maybe I can start with you. And that is that um, the anti-vax campaign is quite uh, prevalent. And if you'd known what was going to happen, how would you in the media have prepared people for, for vaccines? How could we have done it better if we'd had time? So I think one advantage we've had in this country is that we've had HIV and we've had HIV denialism, which is um, very comparable to anti-vaxxers, although I think anti-vaxxers is perhaps a smaller group or it was less, it's been less sustained. So I think in order to, to counter the anti-vax lobby, to equip people, it, the biggest gift you can give them is the basic science of how vaccines work. So something that I think our health department has really lacked in doing is good, sustainable communication. There's been moments of niceness where they've communicated stuff, but it has not been sustained. And at Bekesisa, we get a lot of questions, also attacks from anti-vaxxers. But the request from people who want sincere information about vaccines is so basic. And it's information that you would think should have been communicated to people in effective ways by now. So if, you know, if I can say, like, what would I have done if I was the health department? I would have had better communication campaigns at an earlier stage of the pandemic because it doesn't help to have the anti-vaxxers come and then you counter what they say. You need to have the information beforehand in people's heads and then they equip to, or they less vulnerable to, to such information. And um, I have found in our sort of social media communications with people, it's very effective to not respond to anti-vaxxers at all, but rather to respond to the issues that they raise. So if anti-vaxxers attack you, don't say anything, rather do a story later about if they complain about side effects of vaccines, then do a story about side effects. And I must say, um, in the way that scientists have helped me during this pandemic understand things, 
I think we have amazing scientists who are really able to communicate things in easier in easy ways. I just don't think there's always the channels for them to make that available on a mass scale. And I think that's what we can improve on. Thank you, Mia. Ames, do you have a comment? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to the government com you know, communication from the state departments, I think where we failed was right at the outset, the, the funds for communication vibed away digitally. And there was no funding to actually get this communication out. And that's where the problem is. So the rot actually was there even before communication was being planned. And here the state failed us dismally in terms of that. And, and it was left to the journalists, to the scientists, to civil society to actually try to communicate with people and convince people. Thank you, Ames. Uh, Martin? Alex, thanks for your wonderful analysis of the situation. I mean, I think what you're reflecting on is how the pandemic exposed the cracks with that were there before, because many of the concepts you talk about, <coughs> decentralization accounting, these are not new to the health systems failure that we, we know in this country. So how do you think we can use this opportunity of the pandemic highlighting these as academics and as scientists and as clinicians to actually, again, highlight those issues and try effect change? Because it's not going to come from inside. Of that, I'm pretty sure. Thanks. I think uh, the, the question really is, is oh, oh, how, how does the conversation proceed from now? Because it does have to, uh, I think it's absolutely critical that this becomes one of the top issues to deal with um, going forward. Because essentially now, I mean, I've, I've been around the health system for a long time. I've set up institutions in this health system. Um, they've been captured subsequently. I've seen how quickly it happens and how easily it happens in the current context. Um, I, and uh, the, the problem is uh, you can't advise anybody on policy in an environment like this. Advice means nothing if you've got a dysfunctional organization that can't uh, act on it. So essentially it has to become the top conversation. So the question really is what should our, what should our governance framework look like going forward? This is every hospital. This is our EMS. This is our um, mental health services, our forensic services. Um, the relationship between national pro province, governance structures, how we deal with medical legal liabilities and issues like this. And I point out just the absence of proper clinical governance frameworks in the system as a whole and no response to it. The response to a cerebral palsy child in South Africa isn't to go and investigate how that child got that way and all the systemic failures in that hospital that resulted in that. No, none of that. It's just a legal response. Mm. This is what's wrong with our system. So essentially, the, the, investiga the investigative structures which need to be independent of the people who are investigated, the regulators who need to be independent of political, of the executive of government, understanding where you have to have these separations, understanding how to create supervisory boards that actually mean something. Supervisory board means you've got to design both the board structure, how, do, how, do, how are the people on that board, what, 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 what powers should they have, who nominates, who appoints, who removes. The chief executives of organization, who appoints, who removes. Those are key things in a design structure and we essentially have to go through province by province, organization by organization and change what we have. And maybe just the final point, if we had to look at the Gauteng situation, I do point this out to quite a few people. If you had to look at the legislation that governs the Gauteng Department of Health, most of it is pre-94. So little has been done to modify the institutional framework of a deep, very, very complex system that employs 68,000 people and is now totally dysfunctional because it has no uh, coherent institutional design and the regulations are, are, are from a, 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 de, a, a very long period in the past that bears no relationship to what we have to deal with today. 
Thank you, Alex. I'm afraid because of time, we're going to have to, sh to shut the um, discussion down um, and we'll break for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, what, 10 minutes? Five minutes, a comfort break for five minutes. <laughs> and then we will reconvene. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers.
Okay, colleagues, well, welcome back, and thanks for uh, being so efficient with your coffee drinking. Uh, in the interest of time, we are chasing a clock. We're going to get straight into the next session, which uh, is, is, again, a most interesting and uh, thought-provocative, uh, thought-provoking uh, session. Um, we are going to appeal to all the speakers, uh, if they can, to try and limit their input to eight minutes, if you don't mind. We've got some time to catch up. And so that we uh, are consistent as the co-chairs here in trying to save time, I'm going to hand over immediately to, to Cheryl. Um, Cheryl is well known, I'm sure, to each and every one of you, uh, who very uh, extensive CV will not be found in your program, but I can assure you it is extensive. There are highlights. I think uh, they're all well noted. And Cheryl, in the interest of time, over to you. Thanks. So th thanks, thanks, uh, Stavros, uh, for the introduction. And, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce the first speaker, who is Professor Peter Benyosulu. Can I just check, is Peter on? Is he Because he's joining us by Zoom. Is he on the Zoom? So yes, yeah, yeah, is yeah a, I'm here. Is a, is, hi, Peter. Is a, is a, I can't see I can hear you. Is a, Professor of Epidemiology at Stellenbosch University, but his main claim to fame is that he, I was his, his supervisor for his master's in epidemiology many, many years ago. In fact, he was one of my first ever students. So we've known us each other a very long time. And it's great to have you, Peter, and you can go straight into your talk on epidemiology, diagnostics, and surveillance um, applications during pandemics. Thank you very much, my supervisor. I did appreciate the introduction. I need to be dis disabled by the host so that I can share my screen. I need to be, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if you, you are seeing where I am now. We, we can see. I share. I see this. I see this. It's not in the presentation view. We see the slides, but it's not in presentation. <clears throat> just change the view. Perfect. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm presenting this chapter on behalf of my colleagues, um, or say, uh, Garenda Lazarus and Tobias. Um, I'll go straight. Uh, this, if you do read the book, this is the full content of the chapter, uh, which I will not go into details. Uh, but the objectives of us compiling this chapter were one, to enforce the role of disease measurement, to enhance the value of surveillance data as critical element for effective control of COVID, to highlight surveillance as a cornerstone for controlling the, the pandemic, to emphasize the role of effective diagnostics, as well as um, the role of uh, mathematical modeling. And so data that we, we all know has actually focused at describing progression of the pandemic, uh, both locally and globally, and also associated outcomes of the severe disease. And we all know that we predominantly use the WHO dashboard that has presented data in real time, uh, giving us an overview of how things are playing around the world. But also we also have uh, data that has um, on a weekly basis been presented actually by the NICD. And this one just highlights the global data uh, of COVID-19 confirmed cases. And this is a year uh, post the pandemic. And this just emphasizes the value um, of uh, epidemiological measurements. And down here in South Africa, uh, this is data from the NICD. We may see that governments um, uh, uh, response to instituting the lockdown was always guided by the evidence that was being provided uh, by, uh, the, uh, by the NICD. And we can see here that as the reproductive number was getting higher, the government instituted uh, lockdown measures um, at a higher level. But also we need to understand the value of surveillance being um, uh, a system that has to ensure information is effectively and efficiently collected for a timely response to help prevent or stop further spread of the disease. And this data just gives us a, a snapshot that 
if you look at public and private sector, you can see that the, the flow of data, the flow of cases in the country was basically the same. So we, we, we can conclude that uh, um, both public and private sector uh, institutions, healthcare institutions, were all busy looking uh, and taking care of COVID-19 cases. But as we all know that to have an effective surveillance, we need to have case uh, definitions of all the measurements that we need to use. And so these are the case definitions that we use so that data and measurements are all standardized and that the outcomes are always uh, evidence and that they are objective. And so here we just highlight the number of COVID-19 hospital cumulative admissions and deaths by province just to actually drill down the point of the value of um, rapid and regular surveillance, both active and passive. But in the COVID-19 pandemic times, we have, really, we have predominantly relied on active surveillance. And we can see here that, that uh, uh, there are other provinces where the caseload was higher, but the mortality may not have been as high. The other thing um, that we have learned during the, uh, the, the COVID time is the utilization of mathematical models. And so models have been developed both in short term and long term, long term uh, predicting um, and using different aspects um, of, of, data, uh, of data types. And as we know, models can predict trends uh, of COVID-19 deaths. And in South Africa, at the beginning, we had to use data that was driven by the uh, case load in, in Europe. And we may have been somehow misled because we used data that of, of uh, situations that were happening not within our context. But as the pandemic was getting mature, we started using data that was relevant to our situation. And that helped us to make uh, appropriate estimates and projections of disease, and that did help to guide uh, decision making at a higher level. And so, from from there, we can see using the modeling data that, as <clears throat> based on different provinces, um, we can actually see how the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic progressed over time, um, uh, 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 and and then looking at Figure five. Um, and mirroring it to figure four, we can actually see that the case load in figure four is predominantly the same as the death rate in figure five, because we can see that as the cases were increasing, we also were witnessing an increase in the death rate uh, or in the mortality rate. Lastly, <clears throat> we also had highlighted in our a chapter of the value of diagnosis. At the beginning, we may not have had many ways of uh, diagnosing COVID, but then as time progressed, as scientific advancement progressed, we ended up with uh, multiple uh, opportunities of uh, diagnosing uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, in, in many of our population. We also highlighted vaccine initiatives. As we know, vaccines are a key public health intervention that helps to control or help prevent disease. And we are lucky in this uh, current um, uh, uh, era that uh, rapid scientific advancement had helped to uh, accelerate the development of vaccines, which we now have. Of course, we are now faced with the challenge of having to make sure that our population, uh, a bigger population of our, our people are uh, vaccinated. And as we all know now that in, as actual of 21st of March, we only had about 9% of the population in South Africa that has been vaccinated, fully vaccinated against the 57%, which is global average, showing that we still need to push our population to be able to access the vaccines. In South Africa, we do have vaccinations. The challenge is that to motivate our population to actually vaccinate. What have been the challenges that have so far been faced? In Africa in general, it is lack of information on COVID-19 healthcare delivery, particularly affecting the fatally ill patients admitted in the ICU. In South Africa, we are lucky that we can have data aggregated, analyzed, and presented, but this scenario is not the same in other 
uh, African countries. And this does limit the ability to make effective and objective healthcare decisions to mitigate the spread of this pandemic. The other problem has been highlighted earlier, which is the social media, a storm of fake information. Uh, this is um, retrogressive because it, it basically drags back the opportunities that we have to be able to control the COVID-19 pandemic effectively by spreading uh, uh, multiple public health in, uh, interventions, including the utilization of uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. But also in, in, in Africa in general, we have uh, the challenge uh, of manufacturing capacity and resources to uh, generate new drugs and be able to manufacture our own vaccines. And so there is need to continue promotion of uh, infection prevention and control uh, practices within the healthcare uh, facilities as we are aware that area Area in, in the earlier times, the pandemic really is, uh, skyrocketed within the healthcare setting. And so we need to continue to reinforce uh, infection prevention and control measures, but also in the population at large. But we need to enhance active surveillance activities, both in hospitals as well as community. But we need also to extend the network of research collaboration locally and internationally. South Africa has played a a, uh, a big role um, in, uh, in, 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 in the COVID-19 uh, platform. And so we need to expand uh, our role um, uh, 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 supporting the other uh, African uh, uh, countries. But African governments also need um, a, a, a deliberate policy to be able to fund research, uh, which doesn't often happen because research often takes place using donor funding or using other uh, uh, international collaborators coming to do research in the local environment without the government's um, uh, uh, effort on their own to be able to fund research in their own environment. And so our chapter does end with what we call question uh, and answers. And so if you do read the chapter, you actually have an opportunity to go through the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, so thanks, thanks very much, Peter. And and um, just to remind everyone of the structure, we'll take all four talks, which will be ten eight minutes ideally each, and then we'll have a panel discussion at the end if you do have questions. Um, but to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Wasila Jasset, who who heads the the DACOV National Hospital Sentinel Surveillance. She's a public health specialist, um, and she essentially uh, donated her time. She came as a volunteer to NICD and ended up uh, for two years running what has been an incredibly uh, successful um, program with tremendous uh, public health impact. And, and I think she'll tell us a little bit about uh, that program. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nice to not be here to share data, but to maybe reflect a little bit on where we've come uh, over these past two years. Um, so let me take you back to, is that working? Okay, let me take you back to uh, March 2020, when the first cases of COVID-19 were being um, detected in South Africa. Uh, we knew that we were setting up a testing and case-based surveillance uh, and colleagues at the NICD and the National Department of Health were quite busy with that, but we didn't have uh, any uh, information to consistently measure severe disease, hospitalization and death. And Prof. Lucille Bloomberg was the first to alert us that this was important and we needed to be looking at it. Uh, at the time, in the public sector, you got uh, the DHIS, which was good for uh, aggregate data reporting, but didn't have any patient level information. In the Western Cape, there's a good public health information system that would allow patient level reporting. And in the private sector, there are different electronic information systems that could provide information. 
but they were all kind of reporting in March to, to different sources, from different sources in two different places in a very ad hoc manner. And there were serious concerns with um, the, the integrity of the data sharing. So uh, given Lucille's uh, uh, vision, she brought a small team in and that's where the genesis of DATCOV was. Um, we needed a credible, innovative, flexible, user-friendly, secure hospital surveillance system that could give real-time real data to allow us to uh, guide our policy and interventions. Um, so the after the first case was detected, within a few days of Prof. Cecile giving us a brief, we had a, a web-based uh, hospital surveillance system up and running. We didn't go the usual route of the DG gives a letter to the provinces and it goes to the districts and to the hospitals and they give permission to implement. The National Department of Health said we can do a little surveil sentinel surveillance system. So we called the hospitals who were receiving patients, the public hospitals in each province, and started a sentinel uh, surveillance in those hospitals. Within a week, uh, the Western Cape government and the private sector saw the um, benefit for them in submitting data to the DATCOV system rather than sharing it with all the districts and provinces that were asking. And as the provinces started seeing the value of getting this data back from the DATCOV system, uh, more hospitals began to roll out. Until in June, July, when we had about 300 hospitals reporting to DATCOV, the Department of Health took the decision at the NHC to adopt DATCOV as a national hospital surveillance for system for COVID-19. They further strengthened uh, the rollout and uh, provided support through placing data capturers at hospitals in eight provinces. And I'm pleased to say that today there are 259 private and 407 public hospitals who report data to DATCOV, to DATCOV daily on COVID admissions. And we've had over 510,000 admissions and over 101,000 deaths reported to DATCOV. So one of our uh, important lessons was that in setting up a surveillance system, we needed to leverage technology and ensure data integrity. So DATCOV was set up as a um, web-based system and people could input data on their cell phones, on a, a computer or a tablet. We created access to users who were nominated by the hospitals and multiple users could submit data every day on the platform. Um, there were multiple time points for data entry. So you submitted data on the admission of the patient on each day as a daily assessment and on discharge or death. And also for the same patient, we could uh, report multiple admissions. And so there was a lo longitudinal record for patients who had multiple admissions. But what was also important for us is, uh, you know, that, 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 that the DATCOV was set up um, in a very short time. And I wanted to explain that what would have been ideal was uh, DATCOV would be integrated in the NMC existing at the time, but it just wasn't possible with the resources that were available. And so it was actually set up as a standalone system. But what that allowed us to do was to find a service provider who could do a rapid build um, on a ready infrastructure for a website. And so we actually set up the platform within about three days and went live within a week. Now, the uh, hospitals were, were meant to submit data on the web-based platform, but when we found that the Western Cape and the private groups already had electronic information systems, we were flexible and allowed them to actually export those files into the platform. So this would avoid the duplication of submitting onto multiple platforms. So another lesson is that uh, in, in developing a surveillance system, we needed to have a very clear uh, purpose and knew that we needed to keep the, the brief quite simple and appropriate for what we wanted to do. The international sort of organizations like WHO had case report forms that were very detailed and very lengthy and included clinical parameters and diagnostic results. Um, we decided that this was not, uh, that was better suited for a research study and we were doing surveillance. And so we streamlined the tool and to collect the bare minimum of information that would allow us to do surveillance of hospital admissions and severity. And so all we kept in was demographics, comorbidities, complication, treatment, the setting of care and outcomes. And in fact, some of that was not even compulsory. Um, and also what we did in terms of ease of use, most fields were dropped down in tick boxes and there was very little free text uh, on the forms. The next lesson was we needed to be responsive, adaptive, flexible and agile in this past two years. While DATCOV was set up as a hospital surveillance system, we saw the potential for it to be used for other purposes or to expand its use. And so we developed a module to uh, do surveillance in care homes and we enrolled 45 long-term care facilities who've been reporting for two, two years to us. And we've been able to see the trend in outbreaks in the care home setting. We worked with the MRC and the COVID kids uh, um, group and we developed a pediatric registry. So for all children that were admitted, there's a more detailed pediatric and neonatal form that can be completed on DATCOV. 
we realized that DATCOV only caters for in-hospital deaths. And there was very ad hoc ways that provinces were reporting out of hospital deaths. So we developed a module to, for the provinces to report the community deaths. And this would allow the NICD, the MRC, and the Department of Health to do better surveillance of COVID mortality. And lastly, we also developed a bed occupancy reporting tool. So this doesn't have reporting at the patient level, but at a hospital level, so that we could look at the availability of beds, especially during waves. We added fields on vaccine. We did a study on long COVID so we could determine the risk factors and the prevalence of long COVID. We did a sentinel surveillance uh, uh, study in 16 hospitals so we could augment the data we were collecting through the surveillance. And we did an audit of hospitals with very high case fatality rates so we could understand why so many patients were dying. Um, partnership collaboration were key uh, in, in this. Um, so this is very busy, but what it shows you is that NICD developed this and with the help of the National Department of Health, uh, rolled out this uh, surveillance system. Um, very key were the hospitals that provided data in the public sector and the private hospital groups as well. Um, we provided data uh, regularly to the MAC, the IMT, and the hospital readiness group. Uh, we also shared data locally with research organizations, uh, the MRC, uh, the COVID Kids Group, the Variant Consortium, the Modeling Consortium, uh, the National Institute for Occupational Health, and the Sasanke Vaccine Study but also with international groups. And we've uh, committed to sharing data with ESSERIC, the WHO, and other universities where we've done collaborative analyses. Uh, DACA was funded initially by the NICD with some, some funds from the National Department of Health, but the COVID funds didn't last very long. And we managed to secure funds through PEPFA, uh, pay through the right to care, and also gotten a few other grants for some smaller studies. But I think what's also important to know is that the champions in the provinces and the provincial war rooms were key. Were key. Once they uh, had own ownership of the program, we, we saw very rapid rollout. But of course, I think the success of DATCOV lies with the clinicians and the data capturers at the hospitals who saw the value in submitting this data. Um, just to show you in terms of the data we share internationally, um, with ESSERIC, uh, they collect data, uh, and, and in their latest report, 64 countries report data. They had analyzed 700,000 uh, hospital admissions, and South Africa contributed 55% of the, the uh, admissions analyzed. The WHO also, in one of their recent reports, 38 countries uh, submitted data to them, 338,000 admissions had been reported and South Africa contributed 52% of data. So I think what's also very important that we learned getting buy-in for um, implementing a new surveillance system was, uh, was, it was important to provide data for action to those stakeholders who were using the system. So on the platform, uh, the users can download the uh, patient line list and can get a summary uh, um, spreadsheet, a summary dashboard. And I think that's important for them to be able to see that this is their data and to use it for their own reporting. Every day we send uh, line lists and summary reports to the National Department of Health and the provinces, and this also enable their own reporting and actions. Data is shared on the NICD website, we have published numer numerous publications, and the data has been cited in the media and by advisory committees. I just wanted to highlight a few examples of where DATCOV data was used. Uh, we did an analysis of the risk factors for uh, mortality amongst patients admitted to hospital. We're able to show that older age, male sex, non-white race, and the presence of certain comorbidities had a higher risk for mortality. And data like, like this was used in the vaccine prioritization exercises. We've done analyses comparing severity and mortality between waves and uh, uh, variants. Uh, and particularly during the fourth wave, this was very important because we were able to show that decoupling between cases, admissions, and deaths. And sharing this data with uh, other countries that were yet to experience a surge of the Omicron wave was very useful for them as they got to a chance to prepare for what was to come. And I think importantly, a WHO statement praised the South African scientists for that rapid early sharing of information. We also share data with uh, our colleagues who do genomic surveillance and some analyses using the DATCOV uh, linkage was able to show lower severity in, with the Omicron variant. And we also share data on with the Sisonki and others uh, so that we can look at vaccine effectiveness. We've shared data with the South African Modeling Consortium so that they could predict waves and look at the hospital admissions forecast so we could look at hospital beds and surge capacity, staffing and oxygen needs. Our long COVID study showed that of the patients that were discharged from hospital, at one month, 89% had persistent symptoms, at three months, 66%, and at six months, 59% of patients still have long COVID symptoms, the most common being fatigue and brain fog and shortness of breath. 
But what's important is not just to collect and report the data. We also established a web page on the NICD website where we could share testimonials of patients and share information with those who are suffering from long COVID because we know that we may not have the health resources for them, but at least to acknowledge what they were going through and provide some information would be useful. So just to finish, um, I think I've gone through the lessons enough that uh, in a low, low and middle income country, we a simple system with a good fit to the technological and human resources that was available could be designed and implemented even during a pandemic. But ownership and buy-in were key. And I think most important was to provide information back to those who were submitting information. And implementation, implementation really relied on those stakeholders who saw the value, who had buy-in and ownership and, and committed to implementing. Uh, we ensured data quality with a central team with diverse skills and the data was able to provide many insights. Uh, so where to from here, we continue with our, uh, well, for, for COVID and beyond, we continue with our hospital surveillance that's funded until the end of this year. We've had a sentinel surveillance, our care home surveillance and our long COVID studies continue. But where this uh, fits in is that while we still need a national case-based surveillance and genomic surveillance to look at the emergence of future variants and uh, you know the, the way that uh, the hospital surveillance complements that very nicely in terms of being able to describe severity of disease and mortality, especially in this era of this hybrid immunity, wh whatever future variants we might have, it's important to know what the impact might be. Um, and then also where we go after that, I think it would be important to learn the lessons from a DATCOV surveillance system. It may not exist in its current form beyond this year, but the Notify Medical Condition Surveillance will implement some of these lessons to, uh, to develop a form similar to DATCOV to use in future emerging uh, uh, outbreaks. I think the severe acute respiratory infection surveillance continues at Cheryl heads. And uh, also I think the genesis of the DATCOV surveillance in hospitals and the goodwill we have and the fact that we've got buy-in across the public and private sector will be leveraged so that we can possibly develop a national hospital information system going forward. Thank you. Priscilla, thanks very much. Uh, it was uh, extremely uh, clear and iridat. And I think we should also commend both you and the NRCD for being the engine room during the pandemic. Um, colleagues, we, we're going to move on uh, again in the interest of time. I'm going to introduce the next two speakers. I'm going to introduce them all at once. And then I'd like them to, to come forward and uh, give their presentations. And firstly, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Charles Shea um, Wisonge, who is uh, the director of, the Co of Cochrane South Africa at the South African Medical Research Council. He's also an extraordinary professor of global health at, at Stellenbosch and honorary professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at UCT. Welcome, Charles. And then in the same breath, I'm going to introduce our final speaker today, who is uh, Bruce Milado Garcia. Bruce is a professor at Wits University, a senior researcher of Itemba Labs, and also serves as the director of the Institute for Collider Particle Physics. Welcome to both of you, and we look forward to your inputs. Uh, ag again, while we try and find the presentations, what we're going to do, Cheryl, um, I'm going to take leave uh, after the last speaker I have to run to the next engagement, so I'll leave the panel discussion over to you. So once we've had the final presentation, if all the panelists, including the next two that Cheryl will introduce, uh, if you could join us up front here. Thanks very much. Over to you, Charles. Thank you so much. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And so I'm going to present chapter 15, which is co-authored by, which uh, I'm a co-author with uh, Professor Emsdai and my boss, Glenda Gray. So, in the first, in the introduction in this chapter, we have seen that vaccination is very important. But I want to remind you why it is very important. It is now very easy to forget that diseases like yellow fever, like polio and, uh, or, or cholera used to cause millions of deaths in many parts of the world, which are now free from these diseases, largely thanks to vaccination. And just take one example. In 1974, there was a smallpox outbreak in India, which killed uh, 15, 000, at least 15,000 people, 
but five years after this smallpox was eradicated from the world, thanks to vaccination. Polio is also one example that one could cite. About 30 years ago, there were 125 uh, countries that were endemic for polio, but now only parts of two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan, are endemic, are endemic and this is large to vaccination. And because of vaccination, it is estimated that about 20 uh, million people and could have been, who could have been paralyzed by polio are now working free from paralysis just because of uh, vaccination. And of course, we know the pandemic, the flu pandemic of 1918 to 1920, there was no vaccine then. And the devastation was on Friday, 20, 50 million, at least 50 million people died. So we see that in outbreaks when there are vaccinations and when they are used appropriately uh, with uh, optimal uptake, a difference can be made. And because uh, after the, the smallpox was uh, eradicated, the, after that there was a concentrated global effort to use vaccines as a public health strategy, especially for child survivor. And we have seen at least 90% reduction in common childhood uh, diseases. And we, we provide this introduction and then uh, this uh, chapter it provides a summary of vaccine development, access and acceptance with a focus on COVID-19 and the secondary uh, objective is to summarize existing information on monoclonal antibodies for COVID. And I must be careful to just give a bit so that you have an appetite to read this and not provide everything. Then you will not have to read it. <laughs> so you need to read that. So I will just provide a bit now on what we have there. We have indicated there that for vaccines, it used to take a long time to develop a vaccine. After the smallpox vaccine was developed, it took another 100 years before the next vaccine was developed. But as technology was advancing, now more and more vaccines are being developed for uh, various diseases, but clinical development still took a long time. And what we have also provided in this uh, chapter is the, the information about licensure and recommendation of vaccines for public health programs. We've talked about the importance of national regulatory authorities like our SAPRA in South Africa. We've, we've talked about uh, WHO pre-qualification. We've uh, talked about the strategic advisory group of experts on immunization, which is at the global level, they provide recommendations for use of uh, vaccines in public health programs. And we've also talked about uh, continental regional immunization technical advisory groups, which try to contextualize the recommendations from the global level, and especially the national immunization technical advisory groups that contextualize this at national level and provide advice to governments. And our national immunization technical advisory group in South Africa is called NAGI, the NAG, the Minister of Health to do things about vaccination. So we've also provided uh, inf uh, information about specifically on the development of COVID-19 vac uh, vaccines, just showing that there was a fast track uh, clinical development. Usually it takes uh, many years, some, uh, sometimes uh, decades for clinical development of vaccines to go from phase one through phase two to phase three. But this was uh, in the case of uh, COVID-19 because of various factors, this was fast track. And we've just uh, provided here we mentioned in, in this chapter that before COVID-19, the uh, vaccine that has the fastest uh, track for clinical development was MOMS, which was developed in the 1960s, and it took about four years for that, compare that with COVID, where most of the vaccines, the clinical development took uh, one year. So there has been tremendous uh, progress. We've also talked about access. We've heard about this already, where there was a, uh, vaccine nationalism with uh, high income countries uh, keeping the vaccines for themselves. We've also talked about acceptance and we know that in every country we have a large uh, proportion of people who are accepting some passively but some demanding uh, COVID-19 vaccines, some advocating for these vaccines, but there is um, a, a significant proportion too of people who are hesitant, some rejecting, and even some are anti vaxxers So we need to uh, ensure that we provide the right information, engage with these communities to ensure that we have optimal uptake, especially when access is not still a problem like we're here in South Africa. So for the rest of the chapter, so I don't give everything and 
prevent you from reading. So we have adolescent and childhood vaccination. We talk about booster doses of COVID-19 vaccines. We talk about vaccine uptake and mandatory vaccinations, and also about monoclonal antibodies. We have a conclusion, and there are two questions there, just to see that for people who are reading through that you actually retained what we said there, and the answers at the end of the book. Thank you so much. I know that anybody reading this will enjoy this chapter and the rest of the other chapters. <laughs> Charles, thanks very much. We, we're going to turn first to your chapter before we read any other, clearly. Okay. May, may, may I invite uh, Bruce? Uh, I think Bruce is on, uh, on Zoom. So, Bruce, uh, when you're ready, we're, uh, we're in your hands and we're listening attentively. Can I share uh, the slides, please? Uh, I can share the slides, unfortunately. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, we can indeed. I, I can share the slides. I'm sorry, Bruce, are you saying you can or you can't? I cannot. You cannot, okay. Let's try and get you some technical assistance. The interim. Uh, sorry, Bruce. Uh, sorry, Bruce. Are they open? Are they able to uh, launch? It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, thank you. Go ahead, Bruce. Okay, Bruce, you can proceed. All right. First of all, thanks a lot to the organizers for the invitation. Before I get started, I, I need to um, acknowledge our sponsors, uh, the DSI, the NRF, uh, the Canadian IDRC, the uh, uh, Swedish SIDA, IBM, and the US IEEE. Um, so before I uh, uh, talk about the subject of today's presentation, I'll just introduce what is artificial intelligence in the context of this conversation uh, and why machine learning comes into play and how it works. Um, so uh, essentially, there's really no one definition of what machine learning and AI is, but essentially what machine learning does is to learn from the data without uh, manual intervention although the system can be scrutinized. So the way it works, you basically uh, receive some data, say for instance, data from the Department of Health, then you run that data through the machine learning algorithms. You have a bunch of neural networks, typically complex neural network with a lot of constants and activation functions, and then you create a model. That model is confronted against a uh, statistically independent uh, data set to ensure that you haven't created a fake model, that the model is generic. And then comes the most important step, you take that model or predictions through the scrutiny uh, where data scientists together with uh, epidemiologists and practitioners look at the model to ensure that it is compliant with domain knowledge. And it's very important to, um, and, and that is fleshed out in the chapter, that artificial intelligence does not replace domain knowledge, does not replace knowledge of modeling and epidemiology. It basically is based upon it and enriches it. And what it does, it basically uh, constitutes a, a system of mathematical uh, rules and regulations and algorithms that allow to extract uh, information from a lot of data, especially with high dimensions and multiple dimensions. Uh, so let me go through four showcases of projects we did within the context of our work in the advisory committee. 
uh, to the province. And one, the, the first of, of them was modeling hotspots. Uh, modeling hotspots is actually very complicated because if you really wanna do things fundamentally uh, bottom up, and uh, you need to have very detailed information of the density of population, the patterns of behavior of people, because in the end of the day, the transmission of the virus is a physical system of individuals that are constantly interacting. So what you do is you basically turn things upside down, take data from the Department of Health. Uh, there was a lot of effort uh, by the Department of Health and also in the province to geolocate this data. And then you run um, artificial intelligence, in particular machine learning using a methodology called uh, unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning allows for machine learning to learn from the data with the least amount of assumptions. And then what you do is you clusterize uh, those hotspots. Uh, we partnered with IBM uh, to visualize those spots for the province, for both the public and policymakers. And then at any given time, I think this is a snapshot of the tool created by IBM. Um, uh, during the second wave. Typically during uh, a wave in how time we used to have about two to three uh, hundred hotspots and it's very important to classify them, understand which ones are the dangerous ones, which ones are past the peak, which ones are uh, haven't yet reached the peak, which ones are absorbing all the uh, clusters, those are the most dangerous ones of course, which ones have the surface increasing. So that's really, uh, uh, it's incorporated into an index where all the AI uh, gives out a number, uh, if, and there is a threshold for that uh, number. Above that number, the th the, the, the network, sorry, the uh, uh, machine learning learning identifies the class as being dangerous, and that is specified through the color code uh, in the tool. Another important aspect, uh, we were approached by the, the SANDF in 2020. They, they were asking the question, when is a, a wave going to take place? And there are techniques in artificial intelligence that allows to combine uh, all the uh, wealth of data that we were receiving uh, to establish where the data is compatible or not with a wave or is compatible or not with a situation of equilibrium in between uh, waves. Um, and uh, what we did is, is we basically uh, uh, used a, uh, a system of recurrent, net recurrent neural, ne neural networks. This is typically used in finance to take historical data and make predictions. Instead of using finance data, we basically use epidemiological data, including also uh, mobility, uh, for which we use Google and Facebook data and everything is, uh, um, you, you basically feed that data into recurrent neural networks and you tell the neural network that this is a situation of equilibrium, that's a situation that is outside equilibrium and a wave is coming. And then uh, that is much more efficient uh, than basically looking at the number of cases. You can have an uptick, but it does not mean that the, a new wave is coming. So you have to really use the multidimensionality of the data to establish uh, when a real wave is going to come. And this is, uh, uh, we, we developed a, a dashboard of what you see there in red. Um, I think that was for the third wave where all this data is lumped through an, uh, an, an AI algorithm into one index. And if the index is above the orange, then you have to worry about uh, something coming. Um, I will uh, talk about now the vaccination uh, campaign. So back in the day, uh, there was um, the beginning of 2021, we were approached uh, um, uh, by the province in saying, okay, we are gonna get this number of jabs. We are in a situation of a scarcity uh, where demand far outpaces uh, the uh, supply. So that's a very particular problem in, uh, in optimizing a, a system or system optimization, where we needed to answer the question, how, what is the best use uh, of a uh, limited number of jabs? And um, that is a classical example of, of deep learning uh, using deep neural networks. We use the data from the Department of Health and hospitalization, but also very important data from the GCRO. Uh, that had luckily enough uh, come up with the results of a survey of comorbidities in the province before the pandemic uh, broke off. That was extremely important because it's a very good 100% matching between the relevant comorbidities and the comorbidities that had been surveyed 
by the GCRO. So this was a system of about 30 dimensions for which you needed uh, deep learning to come in. And what you basically you, uh, happens on the basis of uh, this uh, training and machine learning algorithm is that you find, find the optimal path of usage of vaccines to classify the population according to risk of severe disease and mortality based on hospitalization data and comorbidities. Um, and then you basically give an answer as to what you, how you have to distribute the uh, vaccine if you have limited uh, gaps. Now, uh, during round about uh, mid 2021, the tables turned and now the problem of vaccination became more about understanding vaccination hesitancy. And now comes an even more complex problem that uh, for which we have used and continue to use uh, natural language processing. So now we have a situation that we still have where we have a scarcity of demand due to vaccination hesitancy. So at the time, when we, if you go back in time, uh, mid-2021, government had uh, commissioned a uh, poll to understand the fraction of the population that um, did not want to get vaccinated. And the results of those polls, and in fact, we got more than one, is that about 15%, 1-5% of the population uh, expressed a negative view, an open negative view regarding to um, uh, regarding vaccination. So we thought, well, it's going to be a walk in the park because 15% is a small number. Now, when uh, the vaccination campaign uh, came in and the, and the numbers were, were trickling in and you did, we did an analysis of the data and modeling of the data, we realized uh, studying the first and second derivatives of the rates of vaccination that the uh, right away we realized that the vaccination hesitancy was a much more complex problem. And then we started a uh, program with IBM to uh, dive deeper into the, uh, to the possible causes or try to probe the system to understand the possible causes of vaccination hesitancy. So one of the first things that we realized Given the fact that vaccination hesitancy is much bigger than negative sentiment, that neutral sentiments, uh, and we, we launch a program to understand uh, social media with natural language processing, is that uh, neutral sentiments are in fact the core of the vaccination hesitancy. And just to give an example, uh, you find a class of uh, of sentiments in social media that basically uh, state a... Uh, an ambivalent um, relationship. On the one hand, uh, the user says vaccination is great, vaccination is good, but I don't want to be told when to vaccinate. And that's a, a big problem, especially when it comes to the youth. And the, the machine learning and the AI analysis or that data allowed us to encounter, to, to classify the different uh, kinds of neutral sentiment. Another very common neutral sentiment uh, is basically people that say, yes, vaccination is great, but I don't like the government as a result of that, I'm not gonna get vaccinated. So this basically helps policymakers and, and the media to uh, refine, to uh, sharpen the, uh, um, the narrative when it comes to dealing with uh, vaccination hesitancy. And that would be it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much. I think um, it's quite nice to have a different different uh, perspective and, and really the use of new technology. I'm going to ask all the speakers to come down. I think we have two on the Zoom who I assume are there. And then just to introduce two additional panelists. The one is uh, Professor Lucille Bloomberg, um, who, who probably needs no introduction, but she's a, a uh, an expert in, in communicable diseases epidemiology and has a, a wealth of experience with, with outbreaks. Um, and has worked at the NICD for many years. And then Ms. Galenda Nagudi, um, who, who has experience, I think, in many different areas. I'm not sure if Galenda is here. Oh, she's on the chat. Um, she's from the Orem uh, Institute Please and has worked um, on COVID as well as HIV and other diseases. Um, seems to be hacked again. Um, so, so perhaps just to invite the audience to, to put any questions they may have to the to the panel. Um, if not, I'll, I'll start with, with one and I'll, I'll direct it to, to Lucille, but then perhaps others can, can comment. I mean, particularly Lucille, I think you've been working in outbreaks for many, many years. Uh, when I first came to NICD, you were, were, were the, my mentor and you had lots of 
experience. And I, and I just wondered, um, you know, usually we do look backs at the end of outbreaks, which we haven't really done for for COVID. But I mean, if if things are sort of pretty much over, you know, what are the things if as we look to the next pandemic, what are the things that have really been successes that we should take forward? And perhaps what are the things that um, that really didn't work and we should look to improve? Uh, it's quite a general question, but but I think if you yeah, perhaps you can give us your thoughts. Um, got a few days. It's, it's really quite hard. We definitely need to take a, a deeper dive into all of this. So I think um, accurate and very uh, rapid uh, real-time data is really important. Um, in, a, in a pandemic like this and, and a local situation that's progressing very quickly, you really need uh, data now. You can't wait for something to come back next week. Um, so I think the, the DATCOV system really worked well. And when I set it up, I had no idea where it was going. It was an idea in the head, and people like Wasilla and the team made it happen. Um, and I think the NICD systems actually worked very well. Um, so um, the second thing is, I think, a unified voice and rapid decision making. There were too many things that took too long to come back. You would make a decision about guidelines or recommendations. and um, there were too many things, too many groups that it went through. Um, and, you know, I think there was, it was much too, too slow in, in having an effect. And I think if you put something in place, you wanted to affect public health. Um, so things like contact tracing, which really, you know, I think took a lot of resources and um, had very limited benefit. Uh, you know, I think didn't go the right way. And I think a unified voice out there, and I think Mia can speak, you know, can really agree with this. I think when there's so many different voices all speaking against each other, the public who you really want to reach uh, are confused and don't know who to listen to. So I think those are the important lessons. But we'll start with that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Lucy. Is there anyone in the audience who has a... Yes, Alex. So it's, just, it's a question on the, uh, on the data availability. Um, the only certain amounts of fairly aggregate data is made public. And the question is, why is the underlying, underlying more granular data not being made available? Um, and that's the first part of it. And the second is integrated data sets. Um, we don't have integrated data between the vaccination data sets, yeah. the DATCOV system, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, testing information. We do have integrated data sets within medical schemes. We don't have it then in the public sector. So. So why, why don't we have the data in the public, the granular data? And secondly, why don't we have the integrated data sets? <clears throat> um, so I mean, I think uh, the context is, you know, with the Poppy Act, uh, uh, you know, coming in the horizon, uh, when we were starting off in 2020, there was a lot of nervousness about the way that data was shared. And in, indeed, in the beginning, there was a lot of sharing of line lists without password protection even. So I think, um, you know, all organizations clamped down on that and, and, and really looked very seriously, very early on uh, at the way that data was shared. Um, so I was going to answer Cheryl, Cheryl's question about what went well and what didn't uh, go well. And one of the things is collaboration, you know, uh, has been unprecedented locally and with global, uh, you know, partners uh, on the one hand, you know, and there's this ease of communicating and, you know, partnering and sharing data, it seems. But then on the other hand, some things that you think would be simple just didn't happen, like, you know, uh, uh, linking DACOV and the EVDS. Um, I can't give you a reason for why that is, but I mean, I think there's just governance issues around the way that uh, the organizations share data uh, and having those in place was important before that data was shared. Um, but, but certainly, I mean, I think in terms of making the data available publicly, we've committed to having dashboards of aggregate data, uh, you know, at the NICD on our website. Uh, we've had requests for data to be shared and have willingly shared aggregate data for, uh, you know, others to do analysis. And where there was a strong rationale to share more detailed patient level data, there was just a process uh, of application and we have made that data available. Um, so, um, I mean, I think it's important. And, and in fact, I think that what we didn't do very well is, um, you know, package the data in a way that's easily accessible for the public, something Mia was talking about earlier, maybe we don't tell the story so well. And so, I mean, we were always looking for opportunities to sharing the information where they could be made sense of in a way that the public would understand. <laughs> Yeah, so I agree with everything, but I think absolutely I agree with you. Um, hospitalization and vaccine data is critical for decision making and what your problems are. And so there should not be an excuse 
um, not to have that data linked and available. So yeah, politics, uh, protection, don't know, systems, put it out there. Okay, I agree with uh, Wasila and Lucille, but one thing I want to add to is I think with the, what has gone well with COVID and having uh, Mia here, we haven't had that engagement with the media, with the civil society, and even with the public that we've had here. And I think that's something that needs to continue. And it is important to know, uh, to put emphasis on the, in addition to all the other good things that happen, on the what people think and feel and their motivations for taking up interventions, it could be vaccination or mask or other uh, uh, public health interventions. And I think we should, uh, going forward in everything, also put emphasis on behavioral and social drivers of people's behavior and uptake of these in uh, interventions and engagement with the community. Thanks very much. We are short of time, but I just want to ask if anyone on the Zoom wants to add anything to those two comments. <clears throat> I can add just uh, to compliment on what my colleagues have said. Actually, the COVID times has it's one of the times where um, there has been a lot of collaboration in, in inter-university collaboration. Um, uh, sitting on the ethics committee uh, here at Stellenbosch, I uh, see a lot of um, um, uh, projects that uh, uh, you know universities are collaborating with other universities, and uh, not just one to one, but uh, one to multiple. Uh, and I think that is that has been so fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Can I just yeah. make a <clears throat> This is my third pandemic or a 200th outbreak. You have to be quick. You have to have agile systems. You have to be ahead of that virus and the curve. And you need bold leadership and decisions. So we had Lynn, um, and you will make mistakes, but you really have to, to move it. Um, otherwise, you will not win. And if A doesn't B, so sometimes plan B and C works, as they will know. And if all else fails, Chocolate cake is the answer to good team <laughs> building, I can tell you. <laughs> so on that note, and it is true that, that uh, Lucille finds food, uh, <laughs> we've all learned that food is a great comfort, in, especially in times of extreme stress. Um, and, and it's one of the, the nice things about being at the NICD that you might get invited to one of Lucille's parties, which are not only uh, chocolate cake, but there's many other delicious food items. So on that note, we'll end the session. And I think we move straight on to the next one. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is the last session. Um, I'm Martin Smith. I'm from the Department of Surgery and my co-chair, Scott Smalley, from, uh, who was the head of uh, the Clinical Associates Program, but has still been credited with a lot of new advances in that regard. So we now move on to some of the clinical uh, components of, uh, of the pandemic and how it's affected them. And so we have four speakers. I'm going to introduce uh, firstly, starting off with uh, Professor Mervyn Muir, I think he's well known to everyone. He's the academic head of critical care at the university, as well as the head of the critical care unit at Charlotte, has uh, done a lot of work in his unit around COVID, but also is well known internationally. And uh, I, I'm going to ask uh, Mervyn if you're ready. Maybe while we're waiting, I will introduce the second speaker. Um, uh, because uh, just in the interest of time. And so I want to introduce uh, Garth uh, Stevens, um, who is a psychologist by training, uh, does uh, a lot of work and in research into uh, violence, racism, and related social asymmetries. And I think in that regard, he's going to talk to us about the uh, psychological aspects of the pandemic. And so after Mervyn's finished, I'd ask Garth if you could come forward and deliver your talk straight away. And then uh, um, Scott will introduce the next two speakers. Thank you.
very informative, and in many instances, inspirational, uh, demanding and distinctive, but outside of it being really rewarding, it was a time for introspection, and that's what this is all about. An introspection such that we can determine what lessons we could in fact learn from this, particularly in the challenging South African scenario. So the first important lesson to have learned was that preparation was paramount. If you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. And I think that's a very important issue. And as soon as we got some sort of inkling of what was going on in China, we called our first meeting, critical care players and all others. And after the first meeting, we had our first protocol. And that's what we implemented when three months down the line, we had our first case. And subsequent to that, that very protocol, which was spread around this country and beyond, was modified and uh, we were suitably prepared. The second important issue and it's come through in this entity again and again, is communication, absolutely essential component of all interactions during pandemics and non-pandemics with engaging, constructive, polite and inclusive involvement. Um, and that helped us address many of the fears, panic and anxiety that prevailed. In fact, at the outset, we had staff that did not want to work. They said, absolutely no. And so what I, in fact, set up was a daily, not debrief, I call it an interaction, during the day and at night, so at night staff were involved, and there was inclusive interaction. Everyone, from the cleaner in the ward to the head of the unit, had an open voice, and we were able to address issues with respect, tolerance, and resolution. And that meant that we could implement decisions a lot easier. Um, staff felt backed and, in fact, very appreciated and, in fact, were able to go about their duties with passion and purpose, with excellence and with effulgence. And as a consequence, we, we in fact, had people who, who initially didn't want to work who, in fact, became volunteers. They wanted to do extra work. And this spilt off to a host of other disciplines, and there was a great knock-on effect. And communication with families is really important. From day one, we... We initiated a communication process with families, which went a long way to enhancing outcomes. Staff protection is absolutely key. And that is not just protection in terms of PPE. It is mental health protection. And that was a paramount issue for people to feel appreciated. And whatever challenges there were, we in fact tried to overcome. Challenges also bring opportunity. And I think that's a very important issue. And right at the outset of the pandemic, we were engaged as to how critical care will set up field hospitals in this country. And one of the issues I pointed out was that there are only about 45 practicing full-time intensivists in the whole country. So how can you set up field hospitals? It would be far better to, to uh, expand our existing facilities, maximize them, such that beyond this pandemic, we would have a legacy and thousands of patients would benefit. And that's exactly what happened. Eventually, I, I said, when they weren't keen, let me be the pilot site, and we did. We trebled our ICU capacity within weeks. We did everything ourselves. And Alex, this is the important issue. We then took it to the authorities and said, sign it off. And so we did it. We would not have been able to manage in South Africa had that not been the issue. And that, in fact, a policy was implemented elsewhere and uh, was extremely useful. Uh, we also uh, looked at what was feasible in the South African scenario. So where I've got ventilators and CPAP devices, we looked at our specific situation and we went and we evolved, created, designed, and then disseminated CPAP devices, which could be plugged into a wall, which meant everyone potentially had a chance. It revolutionized uh, the whole context of what happened from a critical care perspective. And this picture up there really shows you what we were able to actually create ourselves. You take it out of the hands of the decision makers and you go to them with the solutions. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. We've all heard that terminology and the same happens irrespective of the discipline that we find ourselves in. I've always been a huge advocate of the fact that if we do the simple things well, most of the time you will have a successful outcome. And that includes 
in the 100 year centenary, something we pride ourselves on great clinical acumen from this institution and university. You don't need to have all the sophisticated issues. You need tools that cost nothing that you can implement at the bedside. And an issue that in fact now has been adopted worldwide, a term I used right at the outset in, in an international forum was being poor doesn't mean poor care. And I think that's a very important issue. Sound practice with excellent quality care is both feasible and possible. And it's something that we in fact should strive for. We were told right at the outset, we don't have numbers, just do more with less. But a very important issue in pandemics to understand is not to do less for more. And so you, you work around those sort of issues, even with limited staff. And if you enthuse them, that in fact can, can be addressed. Creativity and innovation is important. And I won't go through all the elements, but just to give you some examples, we were the first people globally to point out you don't need negative pressure facilities for aerosolized entities. Just open the windows. You get six to 12 air exchanges per hour. You don't need fancy extractors. And in fact, those sort of things went on extremely well. In South Africa, we had done our own research years before on varicella pneumonias and corticosteroid benefits. The very first patient we had, we used corticosteroids in, and the patient did exceedingly well. And with this, this rolled on and people said to us, but perhaps you're not telling us the real issues of your results because we don't experience the same, but we were using steroids long before the recovery trial in exactly the same dose came to the fore. There were many other issues, including ethics. We looked at our own R's. Is there rationale? Is it reasonable, responsible, realistic? And if you have yeses to all of that, it's the right decision. That patient comes into your unit. If there's not a yes for all of them, you go back, reevaluate, reassess, and reconsider. So even those elements were brought into the fore. You have to be flexible. These are learning issues. And we engaged with everyone and in fact changed our protocols and elements such that we could in fact confer whatever new knowledge there was. And in fact, both the simplicity and the flexibility impacted favorably on outcomes. Every single day, trying to give a positive spin on so many negatives in this scenario, we were reminded of what a privilege it actually was to be in this profession. And we need to remember that. And in fact, that still happens in the context uh, where the COVID entities have diminished. One of the best things that ever happened for critical care, in fact, was the presence of COVID-19. In fact, it brought to the fore the importance, the relevance and the need for critical care and often neglected subspecialty. And in fact, it's now being described as a scarce human resource that needs to be protected. And we can only uh, extend our kudos and acknowledgement to all the courageous champions. One of the most important elements that one could take out during really taxing times was always to conduct oneself with the spirit of Ubuntu be compassionate and be humane, both to patients, to their families, and to your own colleagues and staff members. That goes a long way to addressing the issues. And this sort of thing is something that really made an impassioned, uh, uh, an impassioned um, uh, mindset left me with, with, with something really to think of. This was a patient who was turned down for ventilation, um, but who said, I really want to see a sunset and was taken out from the ICU to experience a sunset whilst the sun set on his life. And so it is possible to make a difference even in the face of adversity and nothing is impossible provided you want to have the will to achieve it. In fact, it's better to turn around the terms. Impossible is nothing. That's if we want to really strive. This is the chapter that contains things, some of the elements there. And finally, we're in the 100 year centenary of this great university and we are all proud Vitsies. And uh, one of the great alumni of this university left us with the following quotation, which I wanna leave you with. It is in your hands to make a difference. And that's not infection control, which was in absolutely relevant in this context. Does anyone remember how this quotation ends? Anyone in this very erudite 
to make this world a better place for all who live in it. And that's what this meeting is all about today. Thank you. Thank you, Mervyn, once again for an inspiring and passionate talk. Um, Mr. Stevens, if we can invite you down to deliver your talk, please. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, that's good. So while uh, while the uh, the IT presentation is being sorted out, uh, let me just say thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, also, thanks to Ames, to Martin, to Dania for the opportunity to just work alongside you on this important project. Uh, I'm going to circle back a little bit and really talk about the, the psychosocial dimensions of pandemics and the way that we think about the effects on populations, as well as population responses and responsiveness uh, under conditions that, uh, that, we, that we saw, conditions like lockdown, social constraint, and so on. So I suppose the, the, the starting point for me is that uh, psychosocial dimensions of pandemics have probably not been very well researched historically. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the, they're probably less understood by those who are tasked with the responsibility of authoritative care and leadership during disease outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. These are not high-frequency events. They are not transmitted from generation to generation easily because they're not high-frequency events relative to other uh, health, uh, health events. They really uh, are a secondary consideration to the immediate and frequently catastrophic health, social, and economic consequences. And when I talk about the psychosocial, of course, I am talking about the, uh, the intersecting psychological, behavioral, and social factors in the transmission, spread, and potential containment of infectious diseases and, uh, and contagions. Um, <clears throat> thanks. So what I'm, what I'm really going to cover today are just four quick areas over the next uh, five or six minutes, hopefully. Now, this is like speed dating, Martin. Um, psychological sequelae of, uh, of pandemics, then the idea of fostering a culture, of, uh, or a culture in the service of the public good, impediments to population volition in pro-social behavior. And then I'm going to end up talking just a little bit about science, politics, and governance in pandemics. So, one of the first things, of course, that we saw was increased um, health-seeking behaviors in, um, uh, in COVID. And this, of course, was no different to what we saw in Zika, Ebola. Uh, and the unintended consequence, of course, of this is that you have further impacts on a, an already constrained health system. You had increasing levels of death anxiety. You had increasing levels of cognitive distortion, obsessionality and compulsivity and contamination fears. I think all of you will have anecdotal experience of what it was like to use sanitizers and how, um, how sanitizers flew off the shelves in supermarkets and people did everything from cleaning doorknobs to packages that they had bought in the supermarket. Neurotic disorders such as anxiety and depression, um, you know, the, globe, the WHO estimates that it increased by something like 25% since COVID. Uh, in South Africa, the South African Depression and Anxiety Group uh, monitored something like a 50% increase over 2020, 2020 to 2021, uh, mainly associated with isolation, quarantine, limited social contact, uh, social restrictions, school closures, and so on. Ironically, substance use and abuse increased despite things like alcohol bans for three main reasons. The first is people self-medicate. The second is when people are bored, they recreate. And the third is that when you put the social prohibition on a behavior, you're likely to increase the behavior rather than decrease the behavior. Interpersonal violence and GBV, uh, certainly in domestic contexts, actually increased, mainly uh, related to proximity associated with lockdowns and the disruption of protective systems, for women, women in particular. Um, and uh, I mean, the interesting thing here, of course, is that men and violence between men actually declined over that, uh, that period, probably for the same reason that there was actually distance between them. Uh, frontline workers and, and the issue of burnout, of course, was foregrounded for many. We know that burnout is related to increased errors in the workplace and, of course, the possibility of lower quality of care. And then, of course, there was issues of uh, stigma and social shunning 
uh, that we've seen in other instances as well, like TB and polio. You certainly saw elements of that in the early part of the, met, the, the pandemic that, that potentially impacted on less health seeking. So I don't want to go into all of this, but just to say that um, uh, the psychological sequelae obviously require a certain level of intervention. And that is a, a certain amount of differential understanding of the vulnerabilities across populations, developing appropriate referral networks, upskilling, building social cohesion, uh, timely information. This has come up time and time again, communication and information and the precision with which we communicate, uh, ramping up health and mental health systems, and of course, policy measures to uh, appropriately resource these. So the idea of fostering a culture in the service of the public good, I mean, is a difficult question. How do you do this? How do you ensure that large populations act in the service of a collective and not in their own uh, personal self-interests only? And this probably does require a certain balance between the enforcement uh, kind of strategies that one saw and population volition. And this is important, especially where states and governance is weak. Where the reach of the state is weak, population volition is critical to fostering a culture of, uh, of public good. It also requires population confidence in structures of governance and those in authoritative positions to make decisions that are equitable across a heterogeneous society. And of course, you can see the problems in South Africa with this already. Scientific information and resources and their outcomes uh, need to be rationally and fairly deployed for all. But this is extremely difficult in a context like South Africa, which of course is the most unequal society in the world at the moment, where measures can simply not be maintained with that kind of degree of equivalence. And when you talk about resourcing, you also have to talk about social constraint. Where social constraints are, uh, um, are applied, they have to be equally endured by all. I often use the example of, um, of the alcohol ban. You can't close a tavern in a working class community without uh, or while still having middle-class people sip on their Chardonnay. Yeah, this is not going to work. Uh, and in other instances, of course, um, you know, the, the reality was that actually the social constraints were not equally felt. They were disproportionately felt amongst those who were raced, classed, gendered. And so that kind of disproportionality, of course, made the idea of the service or service in the public good quite difficult. We also know, of course, when government did try to, to, um, to do this differently, and we were told that you couldn't buy summer clothes in winter, this didn't land well at all. You know? I mean, it was seen as irrational. Um, and uh, in fact, if, if they were attempting to deal with the idea that maybe the middle class uses the mall as a recreational site, that should have been done in a very different kind of way and not in the way that that was, that was articulated. So what are some of the other impediments? Uh, let me just say that, you know, for, for many scientists, the idea of when a pandemic ends is, you know, anybody's guess. But for the social scientists, our alternative is that pandemics end when people say it ends. And this is not because, uh, of, uh, because people are being uh, antithetical to scientific rationality, but the non-adherence is ultimately also occurring when they, the fear threshold for morbidity and mortality is transcended in some way. In other words, people make a cost-benefit decision. They actually decide uh, whether the pro-social behavior is more costly or equivalent to morbidity or mortality in some ways. And this speaks to South Africa and the kind of inequalities that one sees in South Africa. Evolving science needs to be better communicated. It results in trust deficits in heterogeneous communities where literacy levels are poorer, uh, where you're starting to see a uh, different kind of access to the information economy and so on. Um, individual psychological coping mechanisms include things like denial of personal risk and vulnerability. We've seen this in HIV AIDS, of course, as well. Uh, we know about pandemic fatigue and the stresses that, uh, that are per perpetual under these circumstances and the way that they've impacted on population volition. Vaccine hesitancy, Bruce spoke a little bit about this. Uh, again, this is not simply about being antithetical to scientific rationality. We have to understand that sometimes vaccine hesitancy, and I want to make this, the distinction between vaccine hesitancy and anti-vaxxers, because they're not the same thing, and they're driven by different things. Um, but we are, we are talking in, in part about knowledge deficits, but sometimes too much inform, uh, information, sometimes inaccurate information, sometimes contradictory information, but it's also driven by a deep uncertainty and anxiety in many instances. 
Um, and then, of course, you have to remember that we live in a world where increasingly our health is left to us to manage. We monitor our heart rate, we mon monitor our weight, our sleep patterns, all of these things. People make individual choices, and that sometimes alienates them from the authoritative voices that can offer expert advice in these moments. And then, of course, there's the socioeconomic factors. I won't speak to all of those, um, but just to say the question of lives and livelihood, they come up all the time. Uh, let me just uh, say that only a life worth living is really a life worth saving. If you have a foreshortened sense of future, you're unlikely to be adherent to some of these kinds of social restrictions. I'm going to end, uh, Scott, by just saying a couple of things about science, politics, and governance. This has always been an uneasy relationship, partly driven by different philosophies of science in politics and medicine, for example. Um, but it was important for health scientists to, to, to be at the forefront, for, even though it was an uneasy relationship. The translation of that science, of course, into governance decisions has been variable at least, uh, or at best, sorry, with contradictory messaging and misaligned containment me measures. Um, government also made a whole set of decisions on later cascading considerations, economic, political, social, cultural, and that shifted the attack even further. And, you know, I mean, I, I think the, the, the issue here is really about a trust deficit that was generated in that moment that really needs to be managed uh, in, in future to incorporate larger advisory bodies right from the outset, to have multiple voices. Civil society is going to be important when there are contradictory messages coming forward. Uh, but to be mindful that that kind of uncertainty may also further induce um, a kind of anxiety in populations themselves. So let me leave it there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Garth, very much. Um, my name is Scott Smalley, and I'm pleased to introduce our next presenter, which is Professor Richard Cook. Um, he's also my boss um, as the head of the Department of Family Medicine Primary Care. And as I was introduced as the uh, previous head of division of Close Associates, we come under that family medicine. And really, I just have to say uh, what a privilege it's been to work under Richard and, and mentoring and, and learning about his passion and for primary health care. Um, in particular, and, and particularly on the ground in our clinics and our district hospitals. Um, very early on in the pandemic, he was quite involved with rolling out for how do we manage people coming to the clinics? How do we follow these processes? We went to several clinics um, to do this. And then also he got really involved in, in vaccinations and rolling out vaccination programs. And I got um, spurred on by that and then got asked by the, the DBC to help with the vaccinations here on campus. And I just, we've heard a lot about vaccinations and I think it's, it's really about primary health care. You know, what can we do at the forefront is vaccinate. And I'm so pleased to, to say that within our VITS community, 90% of us are vaccinated and have uploaded our vaccination certificate. So the message of primary health care is reaching, you know, our population, our people, and, and maybe thanks to, to Richard and his work with the Department of Family Medicine. So it's chapter 19 that we're gonna hear from now. I'm really excited, pandemics and primary health care. Thank you, Richard. Right, thank you, Scott. And uh, so to, to get straight into it, I, I'd like to dedicate this, this particular chapter and, and, uh, and my talk today to those scientists and clinicians and researchers who quite simply just get on with it and put solutions in place that can be for the betterment of our communities in South Africa and, and internationally. And that's really much of that particular theme is what I want to be, be speaking to around much of the the focus of, of what we are, what, what this chapter entails. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. It's all about teamwork. And, um, and it's, it's, it's uh, so, and it's these particular areas that I want to touch on in my, in my talk today, that chapter 19 is all about. Um, to note that I'm, I'm a, um, a WITS um, School of Clinical Medicine, HOD of Family Medicine, Primary Care, Scott said, and so I'm wholly vits, and yet was the de facto clinical lead with respect to um, the, the um, PHC preparedness within the Johannesburg Metro District and the COVID field hospitals in, the, in, the, um, in Johannesburg Metro. And I want to say something about both of those. I'm not going to touch on the vaccination program. I was responsible for the, for the rollout within the Region D Soweto um, region of Johannesburg Metro again. And really... Um, it's about the frameworks and tools that we employed um, on the ground in, in practice and some of the lessons learned um, from, from that particular experience. And so um, just to reflect briefly on the, on the primary health care um, related COVID cost, which my, my chapter starts with, um, a, a study by 
by Pillar and our very own um, Peter Barron of the, of the School of Public Health was noting that in 2020, 2020 that the, the number of, of HIV tests decreased by 3.4 million. The percentage of uh, inf infant mortality percent percentage went up by about 4.3%. And our overall head count went from 99 million to about 81 million between the periods of March and, and December of 2020. And, and it's on reflection now on those figures that at the time we were thinking, okay, what can we do in the Johannesburg metro context to essentially try to prepare PHC facilities appropriately? Now, it wasn't necessarily about um, anything, any, any particular reduction of infection. We weren't sure of that as to whether we could do that. And I mean, Prof Mahdi has spoken about some of the futility of that in our communities but perhaps more so about just the access issues, because really the two big issues are for, as, as um, outlined by some of the data in the chapter, suggest that it's access and economy that are, two, are, the, are the real big blows um, when it comes to, to primary health care. And there's a particular disadvantage, especially in rural and underserved areas um, for, with, it, with regards primary health care. Um, yes, around the, the whole inequities, health inequities between urban and rural on the one side, between private and public on the, on the other. And then of course, between hospitals and PHC-based facilities or care that's provided. So what, what could we do at a, within Johannesburg Metro District to try to um, address some of, of this, this preparedness? And after the first case of COVID in South Africa in, on the 5th of March, um, we only really got going um, on, in April on this particular project and reflecting on Mervyn's comments that they that they got to going right at the beginning when we heard when we heard about the China um, uh, numbers, and, and that's 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 given me some pause for thought. But it was really this sort of thing that we were con we were grappling with within the clinics the clinic context, in that could we could we provide a little bit more dignity? Could we provide a little bit more cognizance of of the of the the, the COVID pandemic as affects people just quite simply visiting very busy and and essentially quite poorly managed in terms of crowds and people and the like clinics. And so we put together the practical COVID-19 health facility preparedness book. Now here I must acknowledge um, my colleagues, Lynn and Tom, and then colleagues from the um, DFM, uh, Department of Family Medicine, Johannesburg Metro District. And we got together and worked on this. In fact, on a personal note, Lynn and Tom were both uh, with me when we started up the HIV clinics in 2004 in the former trans guy and we did a big, big project there. So we worked very well together already and we just came together and it all, it all kind of clicked, which we were, we were pleased about. Um, the the um, International Aid Society and Orem were, were key partners in this as well. And, and look, it was just quite simply a case of, of trying to triage appropriately in the clinics and have, have particular ways in which we could essentially look to, to look after our, our COVID um, 19 symptomatic patients um, or visitors to the clinics and those who were coming for the for the focus on on um, on just the normal services and receiving them now and just to share a couple of photographs um, most of it was all outside in terms of our setups now you can imagine that had we done this over december um, and the second and third second wave in particular would have been more pr problematic with respect to how ting but because we were looking at april uh, april onwards we relied on some good weather in Gauteng to be able to do so outside, mindful of the ventilation benefit that Prof Mahdi had also been speaking to us about. But essentially, it's about the messaging and it's about communication. And again, as Mervyn was referring to, now there are 121 facilities in Johannesburg Metro. 11 of those are community health centers and, and the balance are primary health care clinics. And we, we literally th thrust this message down the throats of, of the staff and the patients in these facilities. And that if we could try to replicate these five areas uh, with respect to the system, then we would then potentially we could, we could do some, some good. In that first and foremost, we're one healthcare system. And so, so let's work as such in terms of, of, our, of our teamwork and our coordination. Secondly, yes, they're the CHC level at which we implemented the systems first, and then they're the clinics to follow. They're bigger uh, CHCs in the clinics, so we look to do this there. Thirdly, we triaged according to three zones, yellow, 
uh, blue and orange. And blue essentially was the patients for still for screening when they arrived at the facility. Yellow was that. Blue was the ones who are coming for, for then for normal healthcare services who are not symptomatic. And then the orange zone would be those who are symptomatic and we could, we could manage them appropriately. The four objectives of PHC readiness, facility readiness, we're also very keen to promote. One, that we need to protect the healthcare workers. Two, that we need to protect the patients. Three, that we need to be able to, um, to offer the appropriate services, the normal services in the clinic. And four, that we need to refer appropriately. But then really in the orange zone, there were five messages that we needed to, 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 to just emphasize or services that we needed to provide within that in terms of the, to the community and, to, and that our uh, healthcare workers all understood. Firstly, that we're testing for, for uh, we're assessing the severity of the patient coming with COVID symptoms and referring if necessary. That was critical from a clinical perspective. Secondly, that we're testing for HIV and TB still within the orange zone so that, that we didn't, we tried to address that access issue. Thirdly, that we, we are, um, that we are providing for, for patients who are, um, we're providing for COVID testing in that, in that particular scenario. Um, fourthly, that we are looking to, to provide the, the, protect, the uh, protect the other patients in the sense of we want to be promoting the normal access to services. And fifthly, the referral. So we, we, we try to focus on this particular messaging. Now, the the facility preparedness was, was critical. And what was nice is that we also had a significant number of VITS volunteers um, that were in place. Now, some during the lockdown period, when we didn't have the, the, the uh, Faculty of Health Sciences operational per se, in terms of particular our clinical students, for a short period of time, we locked, we didn't have the clinical services up and the clinical programs up and running, and certainly not the ones, the non-clinical, the earlier clinical years. On retrospect, in retrospect, was that appropriate? I don't think so. But however, we had about 650 students who registered and we managed to place over 450 of those students in a volunteer program. And the, the, of those, 80% were undergraduates and 50% of those were medical students. And so it was quite a successful project, I think, to just engage the students in that, in that setting. And that bar on the right is the students who were involved in this particular project and helped us in terms of screening and helped us in terms of just being able to be runners or whatever it might be in that context. So it was pleasing to see that they could get involved in that setting. So then onto the field hospitals. And I was responsible as the clinical lead for the NASREC field hospital. And this is one of the NASREC, forgive the poor focus. This was one of them that had, was involved the field hospitals. And we went from that to this. I tried putting up some of these boards myself didn't do my DIY skills at home any good, my, my wife tells me. But we had this, this set up there. And there were a whole lot of volunteers in the first wave that, that helped us with this, from private across the board and, for, and across the different MDT uh, functions. And so we had to put quite clear governance rules in place. And we had a number of, SPI was a huge assistance, Solidarity Fund. We raised a considerable money through the WITS Health Consortium, again, as a vehicle um, by which of support from WITS. And, and it, it provided us not with a classic linear delineation of the facility of the function of NASREC, but rather that we could go between the quarantine and isolation facility and then the intermediate care on oxygen and back again for them being in the same facility. It started off as a quarantine facility and then we added the intermediate care. At that stage, only on um, the step down care on uh, portable oxygen, but we had we had then uh, were able then to appropriately refer back and forth. Was it a success from an efficiency and efficacy perspective? Not, not particularly, to be honest, because it costs money. It costs significant money for a bespoke facility. But for the near 2,000 patients that we had within that facility in the intermediate care, a proportion of which were in the quarantine and isolation, I suggest that we, 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 we did help them to, to certainly as a, as a small subset. This was key in that we had two buses provided by Spire. We kitted them out with oxygen. We had the big um, cylinder, one in each, and three small bottles, um, small cylinders, and we piped it through the, this is a 24-seater. We had a maximum of 10 in each, um, in each of the buses, two buses, and then we had some agility back and forth. 
to go between facilities. And that's between um, all the essentially the Barra cluster predominantly, but also coming from Charlotte as well. And then there's the ABT. And this is the, the we moved then at the third wave. So it was one and two waves at NASREC and three and four. Now, this was much more perhaps what we might call efficacious and efficient because it was on the property of, of uh, Baraguana, uh, is on the property. We're still running it there in step down capacity. And between those dates of July 2020 and February of the following year, 2021, that was then the, the facility was, the area was cleared, um, foundations put in and the facility built. It's a, it's a, it's a very, um, for, for the ABT, for the alternative building technology that it is, it looks exactly like a, a normal facility um, inside. And the, it is a very, very clean and, and modern looking facility, perhaps unlike some of our PHC facilities elsewhere. But what is important to recognize here is that interestingly, so there are no ablution facilities. Um, there were only two per ward and those were in the isolation rooms. It was a bedpan system, which wasn't very practical at all. And that, that, that we, we, so we could only use 23 of the 25 beds in each of the wards. Um, but many of the patients were ambulatory and they could get up and from piped 500 beds piped oxygen and they could get up out and about and they could get to the to the ablutions. But it was something that that um, did work from an agility perspective in particular. It's it's inefficient in some ways in NASREC. This was closer. So from an efficiency and efficacy point of view, it was challenging. And I'm not sure that that worked. Certainly not at NASREC because it was too expensive and we didn't benefit enough patients from a system perspective. But from a continuity perspective, integration perspective, and agility perspective, thinking of our healthcare workers and our patients in particular, to have that option to be more agile and put them in, transfer them to ABT on our bus, if they're ambulatory, of course, or on the ambulance and then back again when things are, when, when, when the pressure's off the beds. And some final reflections, please, clinical associates, colleagues, mid-level healthcare workers, if we can look to their value, understand their value, I'm a little bit of an advocate for this, so I'm abusing my position on platform here to just punt the clinical associates because they're quite frankly remarkable for the value add that they provide in these settings. And the numbers of COVID, numbers who have been employed in COVID-19 since the beginning have, have escalated rapidly for the value add and the cost effectiveness that they, that they, uh, that they provide. And then just the disruptions as learning opportunities. When we move the patients from H1 and H3 at Baragwanath, because the oxygen all goes down and they all get moved to ABT. When the oxygen goes that went down at Berta Kloa Hospital, that and they all came to ABT, and then we moved them back again. It, it, there's, a, there's a disruption that we can take lessons from and learning from, and that's uncertainty that has been mentioned a few times that we all need to be, to be prepared for and learning from. And just lastly, uh, from, a, from, a, from a family medicine perspective, one, my last slide, Scott, if I may, and that is just that, that I'm just really conscious of the fact that we, we, through the PHC preparedness, the field hospital, we're herding our patients into zones. They're almost, are, are we considering our patients as people and their own, their own real concerns, ideas, expectations about their care? And, and this has been a real challenging time for the patients from that perspective. And so the freedom of individual choice is being quite limited. And, and it's just the, we've been talking with internal medicine at Baragwanath and wanting to launch around the continued involvement of the ABT facility, mindful the dental school will go in there, mindful the gynae oncology will go in there, but can we use the remaining space for the, Sereti, Sereti project, which is essentially in Sasutu, the dignity project that allows the step down and spillover and the like to be, to be achieved through a partnership between family medicine and primary care and the hospital-based services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Some serious lessons learned in the process of what's been happening in primary health care and, and COVID-19. So pleased to announce our last speaker, our last presenter for the evening, um, my friend, Paula Bernard Ashton, and she is um, with the School of Therapeutic Sciences in the Faculty of Health Sciences, and she's also the manager and director of, of Fundinathi, 
um, Learn With Us, which is the E-Zone location. If you haven't been yet to the education campus, you need to check out the E-Zone, very interactive learning space um, with blended learning and electronics and technologies. Um, she's a, a co-author in this next chapter, and this is chapter, I have it marked, chapter 12, oh. <laughs> um, because uh, she's a co-author with myself and with Prof. Helen Moyesway. So really pleased that she's presenting today. The title is Curriculum Change and in Teaching Innovations in Health Science, uh, an Essential Requirement in the Era of Pandemics. So we're talking about education and curriculum and what effects uh, the pandemic had on that, what lessons we can learn, uh, bringing the best of the best together, our e-learning, our blended learning, and our face-to-face -face learning, and what works. So Paula, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Scott. Um... Yeah, I'm a shorty, so let me bring it down. Um, so I have the honor of being the last person today. So does that mean I have the last say? Um, no, I, I know our prof is coming a bit later, but um, yes, thank, thank you for the opportunity to give a bit of a health professions education and in general, um, higher education uh, component to dealing with the pandemic and some of the experiences um, that we went through. So. Um, I don't know why I got the short straw and uh, Prof. Helen Miezwa is, is um, unfortunately not well today, but um, she is, she's listening online, so I hope I do her justice on her part, and Scott, I hope I do you some, some justice as well. So curriculum change and teaching and um, innovations in, in the health sciences, and what do we do to innovate? Uh, and so our... Um, our main focus, and I've heard the word a lot in the last two or three hours, is agility. So agility kind of became a, almost a theme song, I think, for everybody. Um, in terms of, of crisis, there is the opportunity for innovation. And I think why waste a good crisis is, is one of the key phrases that we've used for one of our research projects. But in order to get a crisis, they, it creates a certain amount of change. And for us, it was a rapid displacement of the classroom teaching environment onto the remote online learning platforms, um, an upheaval of clinical practice um, that we've heard a lot about with a shift towards uh, disaster management, um, and also a lot of personal experiences about real world issues. I, I think we all lived um, the, our first ever lockdown. I mean, I have a vague memory of curfews from my childhood, but never these hard lockdown environments. We, a lot of us experienced personal loss. So our students were going through all of those factors as well. Um, and so we needed to bring in a the some theories of education that could meet the demands of agility in the way in which we try to uh, cope with this rapidly changing landscape that initially we thought, ah, three to six weeks, it's fine, we'll be back in the classroom in no time. But that didn't happen, and we, we know it didn't. So social constructivism has been around since Dewey and before in the early 1900s, and we really needed something to elevate away from the behaviorist approaches um, in order to integrate social constructivism and really adopt it as a strategy. Um, so within the team, Scott, Helen, and myself, um, we really looked at what it was that we were really doing. And we realized that six months into teaching and learning in the COVID pandemic, we were using a whole lot of other theories that we had come to know pretty well, but found very hard to implement in health professions education. Um, so Laven Wegner's uh, legitimate peripheral participation was one of them, um, looking at transform transformative learning through competency-driven pedagogies. Um, there, there's a number of theorists that, that we looked at, but we really merged it all into what we call the lived uh, 21st century learning framework. And essentially, this was a way of being agile within a pandemic teaching and learning um, environment. So the foundations of this particular model come from Kurlik et al. It's a 2013 paper. You can go and look at it. It's a really interesting paper. But essentially, what they did is that they took uh, 15 different 21st century learning design frameworks, and they integrated them into kind of a single model. And what they did with that, though, is that they had these three categories of knowledge as almost separate entities. So the foundational knowledge being the knowledge that 
we need to know? What does a student need to know in order to be able to, to act and to do? Um, then the meta knowledge was kind of what we classically call the 21st century skills. So creativity, collaboration, uh, skilled communication. And I mean, I've heard communication how many millions of times uh, through the course of today? Um, skilled communication, how do you drive proper communication that meet, meets the needs of the audience that's receiving it? So those are the meta knowledge uh, Type of, types of skills that, that somebody can acquire, but they all have to happen within a context, within a real world environment. And that is your humanistic knowledge domain. So if you look at the circles in the Kurnik et al um, framework, they are essentially three separate circles that they kind of link in more of a flow. And what we hypothesized through um, our understanding of what we had been doing is how do you actually merge those circles to overlay on one another, especially in things like context? And so we found that there were a couple of um, things that, that created agents of change. And so those are the blue arrows, are the things that kind of pulled our circles apart or had the potential to push them together. So the one being the rapid response um, to the crisis um, and rapid response to change, which can apply even outside of a, uh, an a crisis environment, being able to respond to change makes an organization um, far more responsive to, to the context in which they practice it. Uh, then access delivery process. So um, this has, you know, can students get access to devices? Um, can we access the clinical platforms for teaching? Um, what is the delivery mechanisms? How do we change the way we, we deliver content? Um, and what processes do we use? And I think if you think about the assessment processes, that's had quite a big upheaval over the last two years. Um, and then what is the actual content? I mean, how do we create content that is meaningful for the current context? So if, if the humanistic knowledge um, domain or, or category is really to drive the things like ethical behavior, uh, real life um, and work skills, and, and being able to uh, practice within the actual context as opposed to being completely um, theory and then a bit of practice and a bit of theory and a bit of practice. We really tried to look at what agents could move between each other. We had to create a whole new set of, of knowledge around how, how do we upskill our, our students in understanding donning and doffing of PPE, for example. Um, and so obviously we had a number of people or stakeholders that, that had to be involved in this. So you look at the stakeholders such as the services, the students, um, the community, the academics, um, and leadership in an organization. And then the red arrows are the things that we saw as the threats to us being able to deliver the curriculum in the timelines that we were provided. And so those are things like not having efficient systems, not having um, good preparation, the fear, rigidity of change, um, and the power dynamics that, that come through in these kind of situations. So we use basically the blue arrows as our framing um, environment for the rest of the chapter. And I'm not going to go into too much detail because this is still, it's a, still a lived framework. We are still changing it um, and it's dynamic as, as the pandemic and as our shift to the new normal um, evolves. But in terms of the, the rapid change, one of the key factors was management and systems. And we felt that that, that was one of the things that we did really well at BITS and especially in the faculty. Um, we had two kinds of teams that sort of formed um, large, largely of their own accord, but also, you know, then people pulling others in. So we had the response leadership teams and we had the actual action or doing teams. Um, and you can see some of the examples there. The one that I was very involved in was the faculty teaching and learning response team. Um, and right at the start, before we even had the first lockdown, as a response team, when we knew this pandemic was going to hit, we, we held a then face-to-face, -face, socially distanced, training for lecturers over two days for academics and there's some people in the room that were were there in order to try and prepare some of our lecturers for this quick move online 
what kind of technology tools could you use? We gave them access to a team where we continuously added resources and created a network. The logistical team, um, that was one of, of Scott's big teams, um, and they, they really did a lot around creating things like the COVID handbook, making sure that students could actually get to clinicals and back. We had to deal with things like digital apartheid and how we equipped our students and our lecturers and our support staff. I mean, one of the biggest queries I had was, I have a desktop in my office, but I'm working under lockdown um, as, a, as a secretary or a support staff. How do I work? What do I do? How do I get data? So there are various dimensions in terms of the digital apartheid component that we had to co combat. Um, and then we had to look at, at the evolving theories and, and changing our pedagogies, um, especially with things like the return to the clinical platform. Um, and this is where things like COVID and book became quite important, preparing and educating our students on COVID and then changing our, our assessment strategy. And there's a lot of big debates going on in higher education about the the shift towards programmatic evaluation. Um, and you can see we've, we put a bit of a table in the book as to some of the benefits, but some of the challenges to programmatic assessment. So in conclusion, we will not return to pre-pandemic habits. The curricula became a living entity with an organic creation of the lived 21st century learning framework and surviving and thriving in health professions education is possible through a crisis. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Paula, for the presentation. And thank you to the audience members here. We'll just have a short moment for some questions for this panel. Um, I think if the panel members are just in the audience is fine, but we can take some questions that come up. Um, so we told the vice chancellor's waiting for us upstairs <laughs> and so uh, tapping his foot i believe um, and so i think if we can uh, apologies to our speakers because i think certainly for me there's lots and lots of questions i would like to ask um, but in the interest of time we're going to just ask if we can limit it to maybe two questions uh, from the audience So, 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 Richard, and, and um, um, I, I, I just want to talk, and, and Mervyn, sorry, you talk about the systems that you put in place to manage it, but neither of you have reflected on the actual hospital environment and how the hospital environment needed to adapt. You spoke very well about what you did with ICU, but what about the rest of the hospital? How did the rest of the hospital uh, integrate into what you were trying to do? Uh, because I think those are some of the important lessons. Uh, so briefly, if you could just maybe give us some sense of that. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, and you're quite right. Those are very relevant issues. So as part of our preparation, we got all the team players together. Critical care, in fact, drove uh, an entity. Um, but the whole referral system in how we would contain patients, what would happen in an emergency room, <clears throat> how we would go about testing. Once we'd set that preparation in mode, the whole protocolization of things, in fact, involved everyone. <clears throat> so critical care, in fact, uh, at the outset, in fact, drove many of the issues, but all of the other relevant disciplines, including um, uh, specialties that were, would not be deemed to be necessarily from, from the outset, uh, were also involved. So, for example, we facilitated that radiological registrars and um, dermatological uh, people and people from the laboratory would, would be involved and do sessional stuff in the emergency room, you know, where they felt uncomfortable to deal perhaps with the more severely uh, ill patients. We involved um, the whole hospital where ICU facilities may not have been feasible to accommodate all the patients with how to use things like these CPAP devices, which absolutely revolutionized um, the outcome and saved probably thousands of lives. And these were not only disseminated within um, my own hospital, but all our cluster hospitals, uh, many of the academic centers and, and countrywide. So it wasn't just a pure critical care issue. It, it was in fact a large network um, that was initially triggered, recognizing uh, at the outset, uh, it's why we were so concerned and had the initial meeting as soon as we saw what was going on in China, 
um, because we had served um, in my hospital as a referral center for highly contagious diseases. So uh, Lucille would remember things like Crimea and Congo, which we see a couple of times a year, um, Ebola, Marburg, we, we've had all of those patients. So we were extremely concerned, mm -hmm. set it in motion and got all the players involved um, and then had Thank set you. up a, a, yeah. a whole infrastructure so that everyone was actually involved. Many of those issues were disseminated around. And as I mentioned, the actual initial protocol, which subsequently underwent many modifications, was shared widely and broadly. So, in fact, the system worked exceedingly well. Even Thank issues you. that were alluded to, like the ABT building and so on, we incorporated actually into our setup so we could step down patients. Uh, to ABT and NASREC and other entities. So there was quite a cohesive so, so, collaborative so if I can then just move to uh, that ABT uh, entity. Move in and just ask Richard, you were primary care and then you had the hospital. You did speak about some integration, but maybe you could just briefly sort of describe that and, and how that worked. Yeah, the ABT, I mean, the fact that it was on the Baragwanath, um, is on the Baragwanath um, site, um, really meant that the integration and the coordination between the Baragwanath um, uh, the, the hospital per se and the services provided at ABT could be much more much more easily achieved than than Nasrec, for example. I mean, to have for example for example the 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 surgical subspecs, the registrars, and the like rotating through the ABT and across the board, there was there was huge contribution of of registrars and consultants coming through, and that was really beneficial. I think the the the, the key as well was was communication with an, an engagement, practical engagement with all the referral hospitals in the Barra cluster, in that we would visit the hospitals, we would explain the services offered, we would explain the limitations of the of the referral criteria, and then they could they could have a clear understanding. So we could, as Pat Safi referred to in ENCA a couple of nights ago, the challenge of the exit block, where we're just not clearing the pipeline of, of patients step down in, in this instance would, would, was, was quite helpful. And that, that, that communication within the cluster worked well. And also we actually benefited interestingly from that same network when it came to the vaccination program later, because we could tap into the same network when it was only Barra offering the vaccinations, mm -hmm. which was helpful. Thank you very much. And again, apologies to um, God to you and Paula, you still around? Hi, yeah. ah, Paula. Sorry, apologies to you, but I'm going to bring the session to an end and hand over uh, to Martin Vella uh, to close. And really, apologies to the speakers that we didn't get enough time to do justice to your chapters. Thank you. Thanks, Martin and Scott. I mean, so undoubtedly, we all agree with what we've heard this afternoon is that this pandemic has changed life and it has changed life forever. But what has really been very gratifying is that despite what is happening around us and many of the failures around us, that the people who have spoken this afternoon and the other authors in this book have shown that there's a wealth of expertise and knowledge and that these individuals have stood up in difficult times to in fact address and help address, and I think have made a substantial contribution to not only this country's, but also the region's um, approach to this, this pandemic. So in the first instance, it's a big thank you to everybody who contributed to this book, all of the authors, and I'm sure you will totally agree with me that the expertise that has been shown here in uncertain times has been absolutely remarkable. The other thing I know is, is that the, if we had an opportunity of running this country with the people in this room, I'm sure that we would make a great success of it and Lynn, I'd make you president. But the point about it is, is that the other thing that we've learned out of it is, is that the expertise that is in academia and in this university um, is not being adequately used at times. And I think it's a great reflection on 100 years of this university. Then specific thank you, so I've already thanked all the authors that, you know, and, and I really do think that, you know, they're having persisted in very difficult times. And let me tell you, Ames, Dania and I are like bulldogs after authors when they're not producing. I must say that it really was remarkable. But um, also a great thanks to, to Jutta and specifically, um, Jutta and, and particularly um, Lynn Koch 
for her ongoing encouragement doing this. The organizers of this event this afternoon, um, Antonia, a big pat on your shoulder for, uh, um, to yourself, and then everybody else who attended this afternoon's talk. We are going to be um, now going up to the 11th floor for some refreshments um, and where the Vice Chancellor is also going to be have, you know, um, seeing us as well. Thank you.